channel. <laughs> Hey everyone, we are live at Bat City Comic Professionals on Austin's East Side, and we are here to talk to you about all of the awesome comics that came out this week. Um, I am Shannon, aka Small Press Shannon, and as usual, I'm here with my amazing co-host Phil, aka Wednesday Phil. What up, Phil? Hello, hello. How's it? I'm doing pretty well. Good. Uh, busy week. I finished Planetary finally. Oh yeah, you were you were talking yeah, about being I, in process on that. I went on that adventure and um, took me a bit longer. Kind of a slow. It's like very science heavy. There's a lot of terminology and talks of multiverses, and it gets kind of heavy towards the end. Where I'm like, okay, I need somebody to punch something, you know, like punch a hole in the sun, give me something. But uh, it's good. Like I get why people uh, love it so much. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, and I got to meet Sean Murphy this weekend. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you got to go over to Awesome Books and Comics yesterday and meet, uh, meet Sean Gordon Murphy, who does yes. uh, the White Knight series, mm -hmm. Curse of the White Knight, uh, Batman the White Knight, Harley Quinn, Curse of the White yes. Knight, and uh, now the new Batman Beyond. Yes, the new White Knight Batman Beyond. It's yeah. just going to be a bunch of White Knight stuff. Um, my Actually, my favorite book from him is Tokyo Ghost with Rick Remender. He did the art for mm -hmm. that book, and it's... It's so beautiful. It It's kind of a bummer because we stood in the hot sun for like an hour. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got in there, I was heat exhausted. So like, I literally got up. We talked for like two seconds. And then I grabbed my books and just left because I was like, dude, I'm so tired. Yeah, you got back and you were like, I made a terrible mistake and did not eat before yes. I went and stood in the sun. And I was like, oh, that sounds terrible. Like, but sounds awesome all at the same time. And you were like, yeah. I need to sleep now. <laughs> yeah. I didn't process it until today. Yeah. Which yeah. is super cool. I'm, yeah. I'm so glad. We sent so many people over there. Uh, the phone was ringing all day with people asking, <laughs> you know, do you have this book? Just because, mm -hmm. you know, they wanted the book. And uh, Nigel, the key master, was working with us yesterday. And I was like, if anybody calls, just tell them to go to Austin Books and Comics. Because I know they <laughs> yeah, have it yeah. because they have enough yeah. for the signing. So just tell them to go there because we don't have any more. And he was like, okay. And so he's on the phone like with so many people. And he's like, oh, you should go to Austin Books Comics. They have it for the signing. And they're like, what signing? He's like, oh, man. And so Nigel's just telling all these people, like, from 2.30 <laughs> to 4 today, you can get in line. You can meet Sean Gordon Murphy. And at one point, somebody was like, what, isn't that counterproductive? Like, you're telling me to go to another store. And Nigel was like, dude, no. Like, you should totally go. We support all of yeah. the other stores. We want you to get your comic. And you get to meet Sean Gordon Murphy. Like, all of these are winning things. Yes. And I was yeah. like, thank you. Exactly. Like, we absolutely, if I don't have something... I will find it for you at another store. Right. So I'm glad, glad to do so. Yeah. Um, and he's a nice guy too. So if anyone ever wants to meet him, uh, it's definitely worth it. He's a great dude. He loves cars. So talk to him about cars. If you ever meet him, he loves, that's all he wants to talk about. <laughs> Good to know. That makes sense. Cause he does put like the cars like mm -hmm. in like that. He's got a lot of Batmobile moments in yes. the thing. Um, we have some great comics, but before we do, since we are winding down our weekend, uh, Phil went out and got a bottle of slow press for us. Oh, it's cold. Uh, that's probably because of my car, the AC, I run it real high. Hey, that's fantastic. This is a Cab Sab. I believe we've tasted it before. Uh, at least Matt and I have. I don't know if we've done it on the show. It's oak barrel aged. That was mm -hmm. the appeal and the shiny. The shiny, shiny label. label. Yeah. Yeah. And then I know you like it when they're actually like the oak barrel wines. I so. do. Well, there was an, it's a, the bourbon aged mm -hmm. ones. I think those are my favorite. Yeah. I don't disagree. We can make sure we get this as often as possible for you. But yeah, this is slow this is press. Good. And yeah, it's, it's very, this is a, a dark fruit blackberry kind of flavor for their wine, which um, it's very robust, but not overly grapey because it does have those other fruits blended into it. I think it's good. I like it. I like it a lot, actually. Ooh, we found a wine that Phil <laughs> likes a lot. I nonetheless likes, well, but likes a lot. I'm definitely going to focus on the, the ones that have, like, some type of barrel aging. You know, that seems to be the big appeal for me now. There we go. All right, well, if you are like Phil and you're not sure which wines you like, this might be a good one for you to try. And I'm going to hide it back over here. Wow. My, my rule is stay under $10. Yes. Um, and... Go based off the label sometimes. Like, a, a lot of them are going to taste similar, 
But if you go in and just get like a different type, like we, I always grab cab salves. Yes. Uh, or the ones that y'all really like that I don't like, the really sweet ones. Uh, Tempranillos. Those are, no, they're spicy. Those aren't the sweet ones. Okay. They're spicy. Oh, they're yeah, yeah. They give, are sweet. They give yeah. me the, the hard yeah. Um, So I'm, you know, it's, it's kind of just a, a free for all, I feel like. Yeah. You know. Just give it a try. But if you're buying something that's that cheap, like, you yeah. might not. Yeah. We buy stuff that's that cheap because we drink it all in the live stream time. Um, and it does the same thing. It does the same thing. Uh, speaking of the live stream time frame, of course, you know, the show's a little long sometimes. But while we're at today's show, um, we are in the middle of a battle before I've been down to get it. We're in the middle of a battle that's been going on on our Facebook for the last few weeks where we are letting you decide what was the best book of 2021. We do this little March Madness thing every year and we build our bracket out and then you narrow it down and you get mad at me the entire time along the way thinking it's my fault. But uh, you get you get down to those final two books, and the decision has to be made. And as per usual, uh, we are in a tie between the final two books. So I'm going to bring the final two books up. And before we even talk about any new comments, we're going to kind of talk about some old ones. So uh, first up on the the last two books of the of the options is House of Slaughter number one. Um, or House of Slaughter in general, this is just number one of that cover. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the House of Slaughter series, which is technically an ongoing series, but it's broken down into each of the volumes is going to kind of focus on different characters. We know that now. Um, this is the first volume of it, which features um, Aaron, who we saw in Something That's Killing the Children, goes back and tells us his story when he first joined the House of Slaughter and um, all what some story that will somehow play a major role in the Something's Killing uni Children universe eventually. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know necessarily what that role is. And none of us do, but it kind of gives us a little bit of a view into the House of Slaughter, but I love it because it is completely like, if you've never read Something's Killing the Children, you can read this and not be lost. Um, and if you read House of Slaughter and you don't want to read something that's full of children, you don't have to. You can never <laughs> go back to reading that. So it's kind of cool. Um, and, of course, it features the artwork of our dear friend who we love, uh, Chris Sheehan. So we've got that as one option. And then the other choice is The Many Deaths of Layla Starr by Ram V. Yes. Um, and this book really kind of blew my mind last year. I didn't know what to expect when it came out. We, of course, one of our, our usual watchers, Chad, is always talking about how Ram is going to be the writer of 2021, and yes. it was going to be a big deal, and it was like, you guys are going to have to read Many Deaths of Layla Star, and I was like, cool. And, of course, we're going to read it. It's from Boom. Like, right. Also, by the way, both books, Boom books at the hey. end of the thing. So congratulations, Boom, for winning 2021, apparently. Um, but I was like, oh, you know, like I'm sure it's going to be great. This was phenomenal. It's the story of the Hindu goddess of death no longer is needed because a, a boy is born who is going to bring about immortality. And there's just absolutely no re need to have a goddess of death. And so she spends that boy's entire life trying to stop him from creating immortality. Um, and it comes, there's five issues and each issue is in a different point in his life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and her interaction with him as she finds him in that point in his life. And it is an absolutely incredibly beautiful story. Yes. I mean, I, it was ranked number two for you and I last mm -hmm. year. And honestly, uh, if you boil down to it, I, I think this one is probably a slightly better book in terms of how well written it is and things like that. But, I mean, Dead Dog's Bite for me was just so... Yeah. And we went back and forth on our list of Dead Dogs Fight versus uh, Mini Dust of Lila Star, mm -hmm. like which one it was. Uh, you all narrowed it down to House of Slaughter and Mini Dust of Lila Star. And we are going to, in theory, announce a winner by the time we get to comic book news. But we need more votes because it's tied. So if you think House of Slaughter was the best book of 2021, um, comment that. And if you think that uh mini deaths of layla star was the best book you can comment that you can comment that here in the live stream chat you don't have to go back to the post for the actual battle you can just tell us on here um and if you want to go back to the post you can but i might not see your vote so put it in here and i may only be just holding this up longer so you know which one to vote for 
you haven't voted, so you too I can did. vote by the end. Oh, did you? Yeah, on I this put my one? vote. I'm pretty sure I did. I don't know if you did. We'll I missed a whole round. You missed a whole <laughs> I don't round. Don't know what happened. It's okay. Well, you know, life, life, life finds a way. I uh, think I was upset at you for some of my favorite books going out early. I did. I did not control no, I know. that. I know. I know. <laughs> um, I know. I actually laughed because originally Mini Death of Layla Star in its first round was going to go against Me Love in the Dark. And the final round by one vote didn't come down to Mini Desa Lay the Star versus the Me You Love in the Dark. And I was like, I really just want it to come down to those two only so that I can put my comment. My only vote is going to be a link to Taylor Swift's Look What You Made Me Do. <laughs> and I was like, that's all I want. I just wanted to come down to those two just so I can be like, you didn't want this. And yet here you are. But one vote came in at the last minute and put House of Slaughter over Me You Love in the Dark. Um, we're going to jump into our new uh, titles for this week. So uh, a lot of you might not have gotten your new titles yet this week because Diamond was delayed uh, until Friday. Delayed twice over. We originally told it would be here on Thursday and then it wasn't here until Friday. So um, a lot of those small press books and image books and things like that were all delayed for this week. But uh, So you might have had your Marvel and your DC and your Scout and Oni Press, but you didn't get the rest of your comics until the end of the week. But they're here now, and we get to talk about them. So let's let's just start out with some Source Point vampires. Let's just go both yes. both of these right back to Matt. This is Source Point Press, um, Blood on Sunset issue four. 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 Wow, four. we are already the four. Yes, which makes me wonder if it's going to end at five. I don't know. <laughs> I cannot yeah. tell you by the end of this issue. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little uncertain. Um, I mean, this is your typical, like, 50s, 60s uh, noir detective story, uh, but with vampires. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wonderful because it hits all those tropes. Um, it's a bit predictable, but it's it's been a good time. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this book. I like the art on it a lot. Um, and this is kind of what feels like heading into the third act. Mm -hmm. Like, everything is kind of unfolding, they're peeling back the layers, um, and so I, I feel like we could only get one more issue, but it feels like there's a lot more story to tell. I feel like we'll get six. I know that the, the previous, like, the Rise of Dracula and Cult of Dracula, I believe, ended at six issues. So I know okay. Source Point kind of bounces back between three issues to six issues for their miniseries. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like, yeah, two more issues would be better suited than the mm -hmm. one. Um, but yeah, I, this is a lot of fun. They're kind of adding some more layers uh, to the book as well. They bring in like a gangster squad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like a, we're going to crack down on the crime in the city. Um but, yeah, and, and the end of this issue in particular is like, okay, I'm, now I'm just ready for issue number five. Yeah, there's you're getting all the twists and turns. You're in that point of the, the noir, like, crime book where you see, you know, oh, this, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And you're, as he's starting to piece it together and you're seeing piece, people kind of, the other players make their moves mm -hmm. instead of that waiting for, like, what's going to happen. We're starting to see those other players make their moves and how it impacts him. Yeah. And and so I'm, I'm curious to see how it's all going to play out now that we are seeing this this, dete this detective situation, like, come to a head. Um, yeah. But like you said, it does feel very much like we're just now, like we are definitely at the end of this issue only hitting the beginning of Act 3, so there's right. definitely going to be more than 5. I think it'll have to hit 6, but uh, we do have issues 1 through 4 now that 4 is out, so if you want to check it out, uh, Blood on Sunset from Source Pre Point Press. Yes. And speaking of some vampires, <laughs> in the Source Point world, we have Rise of Dracula, also issue 4. Yeah, what are the odds that it would be two draculas or two vampire stories running side by side um i would say in march of 2022 very likely because there are so many vampire stories yes. going on right now in comics and uh literature in general we are we are back to we've circled back to vampires we we took our break and those immortal beings just aren't going anywhere. Do you think it's because Robert Pattinson's playing It's 100% <laughs> because Robert Pattinson is playing Batman. They were like, you know what? We should bring back in his honor yeah. vampire stories. Yeah. yeah, totally not for the fact that they're just some of the most 
immortal beings that people love to read about. It's all 100% yeah. for Robert Pattinson. I feel like they probably saw a bunch of um, Twilight stuff trending because of him, you know, and they were like, oh, people are talking about vampires again. Yeah, I'm here for it. Um, but yes, this is probably my my favorite of the vampire stories that's out right now. Um, this is basically if Dracula decided to take over the U.S. Mm -hmm. and run it because we as humans just don't know how to do anything, supposedly. And they reiterate that throughout this entire <laughs> book. <laughs> Even in this issue, there's a speech that reminds us how bad we are at running this world. Yeah, it's like every issue you're like, oh, guess what, humans, you still suck at life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're taking over because you're a bunch of idiots. Um Honestly, I think issue three, I was kind of teetering on like, okay, this is this is pretty good, but it's not great like it was at issue one. But then this issue uh, comes in, and I was like one hundred and ten percent on board um, with the direction that this book yes. is going. Um, I really don't want to give the plot away, um, but. Shit's about to suck. <laughs> yeah. And I think your synopsis was really good. Like, it is, you know, Dracula has come in and taken over America and kind of been like, hey, you know what, humans, we're here to give you a helping hand. You're not getting it. And uh, that, that message has kind of changed a little bit. It's, you know, over what, it's the same message, but it's gone into different ways. And it's a really, I mean, that's great because we do see you know, politics work like that, where it's like, oh, we kind of want, we're here for this, and it's like, but those people don't stand for that, and those people come up, and they're like, no, we stand for that, but we just have a completely different way of getting there, and some of them use it in a positive way, and some use it in a negative way, and yeah, we're gonna see that, uh, differentiations over the course of the story. It's weird, the emotions that I ran through with this, because there's moments in the speeches in this where you're like, yeah, we, like, some of this is true, about you know the fact that like we recognize that these mm -hmm. things are happening but we don't really do anything about it um and I, there's kind of moments where i'm like okay i feel like if dracula took over the u.s i'd be cool and then you start to realize that there's like hints of like dictatorship style stuff in there and you're like okay maybe not so much that yeah <laughs> necessarily and we talked about this uh, we had a, a comic book creation workshop today with about 24 uh ut longhorn book club students uh comic book club students and one of the things we talked about in our workshop was villains and how so much of what your villain is you need to identify with everything they say until the split yes and and in this book, because it is it is Dracula, and we are humans, we automatically know that, like, that person is not necessarily, like, Dracula is not necessarily for us. Right. Because we're the humans. And so, while she, like, is the hero of the story, it's not necessarily that she is the good guy. And you get that moment of, you know, oh, this villain, I kind of agree with them. I kind of, especially like even during the speech in, in issue four in this one, you're like, oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. And then you're like, no, 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 <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Yeah. And, and so it's such good, it's such a good villain portrayal in that, like, I want to agree with you. Like, and then you just go right past where I was good with. Yeah. Uh, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this book. And this is the issue that really did it for me. Yeah. Um. So, and now it's kind of the point where I want to go back and read the other one. Cults of Dracula. Yeah, I think I yes. want to sit down and read that one now. Yeah. Um. And the art in this book, too, is... I mean, this cover. The cover is... Yeah, I love that cover. It's so great. Dude, pick it up. It's awesome. Like, talk about badass female lead characters. We're just like, oh my god, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And and Phil referenced uh, Cult of Dracula, which was the previous series that has these characters in it. It kind of leads into this one, but it's one of those kind of like I just said with House of Slaughter. Like you don't have had, you don't have to read right. something as filled children. You don't ever really have to read Cult of Dracula, and before getting into Rise of Dracula. And I think it's we talk about you know those earlier books that a lot of the publishers have. I think Cult of Dracula is when Source Point is really like finding that footing for making this like stronger story and it's like cult of dracula there's yeah, moments where it's like oh this is incredible and then there's moments where it's like oh that 
kind of like teeter on like is this and then yeah. you know you're kind of invested mostly because you care about these dracula characters and it's kind of that's what leads your interest in cult of dracula and engine of course like some of the twists and stuff towards the end but this one is definitely a stronger written yes. story for yeah. the two yeah i definitely picked this one up i yeah. mean i didn't read cult of dracula and i'm having the time of my life mm-hmm. and i think i'm in falling uh, i'm falling in love with uh with dracula that, that's fair not it just like the the Dracula in this story, but yeah. also like the history. Uh, like it was really cool how they kind of dove back a little bit mm-hmm. into the 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 origin of Dracula, and you're like, oh, this is. Oh man, you and I can cool. have some great conversations about Dracula later on. <laughs> um, switching gears a little bit, going to Arkea, which is a Boom Studios imprint. Uh, we've got issue two of the Killer, a uh, subtitle, Affairs of the State. Yes, um, I ne- I did not read issue one. Until this week, right? Until this week. Yes. Um, but this is essentially the story of an assassin uh, who ha- kind of goes through the typical cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has like a day job. Um, there's a lot of inner monologue. There is a lot. This book is 90% narration. Yes. Like, really, oh. and you'll see like when Phil opens it up, it is a lot of... Of big text uh, narration over it. I picked a page that does that a and bunch of it. Because I just want you to see that, like, even the dialogue pages, it's kind of, it's a lot. And he his job, like, because like you said, he has that day job. But his job is, like, corporate, working in a corporation, like, uh, putting the, you know, he's, like, basically working, like, HR at a big corporation. Right. Like, for the state, because it's affairs of the state. Because he's essentially, like, got a government job. But he's also an assassin. Yeah. And so he's working at, like, the IRS office, essentially. And he's, like, got, like, a paper pusher job. And he spends all day talking about, you know, the in issue one, you talked about the, the hardest thing is blending in and learning how to, like, have that water cooler yeah. moment. Because you don't know how to have small talk when what you do on the weekend is work as an assassin. Yeah. And and but that and that but that first issue it was very much like criticizing the everyday person. Very much. Where it's like, oh, some of these losers have hobbies, and I was like, you know, this isn't a comic book where we all have a hobby in particular. But it was just kind of like poking fun <laughs> yeah, at like, the everyday person. We all collect comics. So that's our hobby. Yeah, or there's just like a lot of it. I was reading is like, oh man, he's talking about me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I get it. My life's mundane. You don't need to remind <laughs> me because you go off and assassinate people <laughs> yeah. on, your, on your downtime. On your downtime. But he, it's an interesting thing because it does feel, you know, you and I have talked about this. It does feel like it's trying to hit all of the tropes of mm-hmm. those spy or assassin movies that you see or books that you read. Um, it feels like, you know, it feels like reading a Tom Clancy novel kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and in that same, that it stays in that, like, heavily worded, um, slow movement, like, drama. Like, this isn't a, a spy movie where you see action, action, action. This is one of those slow-moving <laughs> drama about being in This is field. a lot of him creeping on people. In it the, is a lot of creeping. In, like, the break rooms of his place because he's, like, sitting there watching and, like, oh, look at these average everyday people talking about the same drama since high school. And it's like, oh. This is just who we are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right? It's like, you you read that, like, after reading Rise of Dracula, and you're like, I can see how Dracula could get to this. Well, yes. This is probably where she got her intel from. Yeah, if this guy guy knows what's going on, she definitely does. Yeah. I also, um, and I think this was an arc thing, more so in the first issue, but... I thought this guy was one of those assholes that wears sunglasses all the time. Yeah. Because the way it's drawn, it doesn't look like... They don't look like glasses. They don't look look like like glasses. And so I was just like, why is he always... Like, it's even nighttime and he's wearing them. And I'm like, okay, these have to be glasses. (laughs) And it's just the reflection. Um, I think this is a book for anyone who enjoys those, like, existential inner monologues. Mm Mm-hmm. But also, it's like him sitting at a desk for three panels while he's going through that. And it's showing you just like little tidbits of his life. And actually, we don't really ever see the action. Like, when he talks about, <laughs> oh, I went on this mission. Yeah. It's it's, it's like retrospective. Like, the no mission. The, yeah, it's just, oh, well, we had this mission this weekend. And so, anyway, I'm at work now. Yeah. 
And I'm going to feed squirrels in the park while <laughs> I tell you about <laughs> what I was doing yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So it is, it is more on that drama side than on the action side of, of that kind of, that kind of storytelling. So if you're interested in that side of it, then this is definitely something, again, it's more going to feel like reading something like, like, uh, all of those, I'm like James Patterson, like yeah. Tom Clancy, like in that like serious, but also like very wordy versions of a spy thriller. Yeah, it's almost like to me, if you want to see that side of the assassin's world where it's like the boring part of it, where they stake out in a car for two hours, you'll get that and talk about how, like, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot of reading, too. It's a map book. Yes. Yes, it's very slow, like, slow, wordy, like, give me the drama behind it and let's, like, talk about why we do yeah. the things we do. Again, just look, punch somebody, please. Do something. <laughs> right. That's the first thing Phil said. Phil was like, I have a high criticism of the killer. He didn't punch anybody <laughs> yeah. in this book, and I'm really, like, I don't know how I feel about it. And I was like, uh... Okay, so was the book, did you enjoy the book? And you're like, there, you didn't punch anybody. <laughs> and that was your whole criticism was there was no punching. Look, so. if, I, I mean, I spend most of my alone time criticizing the mediocrity of life. I don't need some guy in a comic <laughs> book to do I, Like, I read the comic book to get away from that, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, wow, all right. I like it. I like the, the slow move. I like the commentary. I am curious to see where it goes, but I like I like seeing that side of it. I'm kind of intrigued because you do see does a lot of those spy movies start like that and then they walk away from it. I'm like, well, did they never go back to work? Like, what happens when you go back to work on Monday? Like, you I still don't have need to, to see that. Though. I want to know. I just you know every once in a while you ask that question. I'm glad we get to see it. Oh. Um, st- step by bloody step <laughs> issue two. Uh, this is Image, I believe. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, this is an entirely silent series yes. so far. We are two issues in, and uh, our main character has no language. She knows nothing yeah. about who she is, what you know, how to speak, anything like that. And she is going through life with a, a giant. It's kind of if you made Iron Giant a silent movie. Yes. This is what you would get. And it was more fantastical. Yes. Um. I mean, I, so in the first issue, I was like, okay, I think this is all right, that it's wordless, um, because I kind of assumed at some point we were going to get words, Um, and it's kind of tough. Mm -hmm. Like, the art in this book is fantastic. It's what carries this book along. Um, It kind of reminds me of one of my favorite artists, Paul Pope, and the style of the art a little bit, Um, but it you even introduce other characters who clearly can speak and they still choose Mm -hmm. not to give them dialogue. Well, Mm -hmm. they do it in kind of like, um, like an old Egyptian language. Yeah. Cause she Um, can't understand it. So yeah. Um, and so it, it's one of those things where you really have to slow down and really pay attention to what's going on, especially the expressions Mm -hmm. on the, the main girl's face. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's where a lot of, the, that's where you can pick up on the cues of kind of what's going on or get an understanding at least for this relationship yeah. uh, between the girl and the giant because it's still very uncertain, um, you know, anything about them. Um, I kind of wish because they introduced this new character. Um, I'll try to find him in a second, but he's kind of like the vil- the general, the evil general yeah. type. Um, and they're being hunted um, by by these this this military group um and i I just like i need him to speak yeah because i i want to hear what he's saying um and it's kind of tough at times like if you're not if you're just kind of skimming through and just browsing the art um it's kind of tough to follow what's going on but i mean the art yeah if you're one of those people who doesn't really pay attention to the art when you read a comic this is not going to work because this, there is no words. You definitely have to do that. It's kind of, it's like the adult version of Jonna and the Impossible yes. Monsters. Because it's beautifully drawn. And you kind of have to slow down, like you said, and pay attention to everything that's happening. So that you can figure out where the story is going. I think it's a beautiful way to use the medium. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious to see 
if there's going to be a point where we do see dialogue, because there is a writer on it, which, of course, a writer does have to script out the story either way. But I'm curious if there's going to come a point where suddenly something is going to happen, because we have a premise, too. The fact that they're telling right. us she has no memories and she has no name and no language, like we don't know that necessarily from reading the story. We know that from <laughs> what they keep telling us. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, we're going to... So you're going to tell us that at some point, I feel, because you're giving us this groundwork for more than just a girl and her giant traveling through. Mm -hmm. And if it was just about a girl and her giant traveling through and there wasn't like a point to all of that, uh, not having, not speaking, then I don't think that they would continuously bring it up on like their solicits and the stuff on the back. So I'm curious to see, is there going to be a point where they start communicating with each other or the other people start communicating um, or is it going to remain silent? I'm okay either way. Because it's gorgeous, but I don't know that the whole story point will translate without the, a story. The art fan in me is like, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Honestly, 80% of the comics on these walls, you can take the word bubbles out because that's a majority of the reason yeah. why I read comics is for the artwork. But at the same time, like I read this book and it's very similar to if you decided to watch Lord of the Rings for the first time, but you put no sound on. Yeah. And it's just like, you are going to just, you have to figure everything out based on little details and, you know, trying to be like, okay, well, they look like villains, so I assume they're yeah. the villains of this story. Exactly. Because they also, like, they, you know, there's a lot of opening up the world in this. You kind of see a mm -hmm. bunch of different points, like a, she passes by a, a war that's going on, mm -hmm. um, she sees like a tribe of people, but again you don't know you don't know what they are and how they're connected <laughs> yeah, yeah you have no idea you're like okay uh at some point at some point they'll hopefully let us know but yeah. I, I mean i can't talk about how beautiful this book it's is just, like that spread that you showed the bright colored one yes. that alone would make yes. me buy that book mm -hmm. yeah gorgeous that's step by bloody step issue two from image comics um up next from comics tribe issue two of happy hill Yes. This was the pick of the week when issue one came out, I believe. Was it? I think so. It might have been. It was real, or one of those where we were like, maybe it should have been, just because it had the really cool cover. And I remember yes. us being really captivated by that. But issue two of Happy Hill, we're back. What do you got for me, Phil? So, uh, in the first issue, we're introduced to our characters. It's uh, two, I think it's two brothers, if mm -hmm. I remember. Um, and then some journalists who are coming... Uh, to find out about this villainous character in the woods called the Woodsman. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are at this place called, it's the Happy Hill Resort. And it's like the most magical resort you could go to. Yeah. They like, they're like, don't, nobody walks here. You yeah. take a water slide. <laughs> yeah. Like, why walk when you can slide? And there's just different kinds of slides everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, we learned, though, that there's a little bit of uh, a deviousness to that. Yes. In this particular issue. Like, it's kind of like, you know, everybody always says, oh, nobody dies at Disney. And it's like, but like, oh, but there's all these like conspiracy theories about how that's what right. like happens and why that's a thing. It's that's like somebody took that concept and was like, let's apply it to this resort and everything like, oh, everybody's happy every time they come here. And here's how. And we start to kind of see some of those things unfold in issue two. Yeah, so you're kind of getting uh, unfolding, but they do it in kind of like, we're also going to give you the, the grand tour of this resort. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lay of the land in this issue, and I, I, I dig it mm -hmm. all the way. I mean, I like the characters in this, the banter between the two uh, reporters are really great. There's kind of like this crazy old lady running oh, yeah. around who's like drinking um, but also is kind of in on maybe some of this weird yeah, dark she's stuff. she's like the lavish, like, has her wine, like, and then this is a thing that we're talking about now. Yeah. yeah. And then at the same time, there's a completely seemingly unrelated story going on about a little girl that's lost in the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether or not, and, and the, the idea of the woodsman. And uh, there's this family that, you know, her family doesn't trust the Happy Hill family, the family that runs Happy Hill. And they know that something is going on, but of course, like, nobody believes them. And so we've got this parallel story running of a girl 
who is actually lost in the woods outside of Happy Hill and with the woodsman situation possibly going down. But uh, we're being told at Happy Hill that everything is perfect and wonderful and we have no reason to be concerned. This art is super cool too over here. Um, I Yeah, it's I'm excited as they unfold the mystery behind everything and, you know, get to the center of it all. I'm, I'm along for the journey. Yes. I, I definitely am. I love the, the design of the woodsman too. There's a lot of really cool art and it's pretty violent too. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, but there's some cool stuff in this book. I, I'm a big fan of this one more so than I was expecting. Um, but I think this is just kind of a fun, like vacation horror book. Yeah. You know, like these people go out into this place they've never been before to kind of relax and enjoy themselves and, uh, some crazy, shit, well. some crazy, yeah, some crazy shit's gonna happen. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, this is one of those small presses at the back of the previews catalog book, so it's not on a final order cutoff. So you have to order this two months out, um, kind of situation, and it, it it could get missed. I actually went in and made sure because we liked issue one so much. I went in and made sure that I ordered issues two and three beforehand like because those were already out in the system so i was like i'm just gonna go in and make sure that i order these like separate because they're make sure i don't miss it in an initial order because we loved issue one so much mm -hmm. that i was like i'm not missing because that's what happened with ate, ate the mortal <laughs> we loved issue one and then it, we had already missed the chance to order issues two, issue two so we had to go back and find it um and i was like i'm not doing that again <laughs> i'm going in now um super good happy hill comics tribe um up next, we have issue four of five of Carriers from Red Five. We had a major art switch in this issue of Carriers is from like the this? previous one. It is like that Ooh. on the inside. Um, yeah, that's cool. If you've never read Carriers before, um, Carriers is the story of some militant pigeons. I got it right. I usually say penguins. Sorry, I'm really bad. <laughs> militant pigeons in New York City who actually work. They are carrier pigeons, and they Ooh. actually work to keep the city safe. And uh, they, we've seen, they've been in this overall battle so far to keep the city safe from the, you know, like killer croc, like the crocodiles and the and the sewers and and the rats and everybody like that working together against them. Um, and in the last issue, they actually had a hurricane hit New York, and they were saving all the wildlife and everything, um, and doing a really cool thing with that. Well, we saw something about the hawks in the last issue, and this issue brings us the hawks and the owls. And the owls think that they are also the ones protecting the city from bigger threats like the hawks. And uh, they call it day versus night, essentially, in their battle, their epic battle of all time, that they've been warring forever, <laughs> the day and the night, the owls and the hawks. And um, we see the, the, the idea of whether or not the... The pigeons, the carriers, want to team up with them. And I love this because it's because this book takes itself so seriously. And I'm 100% in for that. And we get this conversation with the owls. They're like, we're the only ones who can take on the hawks. And we can do this. We can help you solve like this problem with the hawks. But you have to do, we're going to do it our way. And the pigeons are like, no, because we won't kill. And you guys are predators. And you believe in killing. But we don't believe in killing. And you'll, if you're going to fight with us. Then you have to not kill anybody. Like as long as you're working with us. So it's like way serious. And then it's. But it's pigeons. And owls. And so you like. Are like this is so serious. Why is this so serious? I don't know. But I love it. And um, there was a point. Like one of the. One of the pigeons gets captured by the hawks in this one, and there's a moment in there where I literally screamed no at the comic book. So this it's oh, this wow. way intense story for pigeons, but it would feel like this was written by somebody who wants people to stop being mean to pigeons in New York or something, because now I think that they're the greatest thing ever. This art's giving me, like, uh, 2000 AD vibes. Like, I'd like to see this in, like, uh, in 2000 AD, like, one of their magazines. Yeah. Um, this art's great. Yeah. Uh, do you know why they made the change? I don't know. I don't know if it's supposed to be because it's from the, like, with the owls. Um, Ooh, and if it's, it's like, that's the owl art or, um, if it's something to do with the hawks. I didn't, I need to check and look and I didn't do it and I'm sorry, but I didn't check to see if the art has changed or if it was, like, 
just something like specific with the art style. Um, but it's it's super cool. And Jason Kimball did art and color on that. So uh oh, some watchmen stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. That's the coolest part that I totally left out. It actually opens with them talking about watchmen and the owls are watching the watch and they talk about like who watches the watchmen and all that, like they do all that. But the owls are watching it and they're like, We really like this night owl guy. <laughs> and like there's a whole watchman thing and then it wraps back at the end to a conversation about that and so because this issue does get like darker into like well is it are you the hero if you kill people and if you do all of that like this is and that might be the art shift right because it is a watchman homage kind of issue for some pigeons and owls and god you guys gotta read carriers <laughs> uh red five just keep making books man i love it so much um Next up is issue 6 of 12 of James Tynion and Matthew Rosenberg's DC vs. Vampires. Uh, I usually don't bring a lot of big two books, but I always like to bring this one because it's utterly ridiculous, and I think everybody should read it. Uh, the entire DC universe has been is being destroyed by vampires, and since all of our indie books are doing vampires, we got to highlight the big two book that also is. Um we are, like I said, we're six issues in. We're halfway through the series. And at this point, most of the Justice League is is a, a vampire. In the last issue, we saw which members of the Suicide Squad are. And they've been hunting for the Vampire King. And in this particular issue, we find out the Vampire King is not necessarily who we thought it was. And we kind of find out who it is, which I don't want to spoil. Um, but we see some major inner turmoil, uh, from the Bat family, who's been kind of standing firm against all of this vampire insurrection kind of thing, and, uh, the vampires finally, uh, come for them, specifically in this book, and we see in this issue a lot of crazy battling between them all and uh if you're not reading it it's really cool because simone DeMeo does a lot of like random pages on the art which is super cool um but it's also just a really it's really ridiculously amazing um i mean you got tiny and Ann rosenberg on it right. so of course you get some really cool uh ideas in here but yeah this is it's been great there's i was talking to some of the the students from the Longhorn Club today that had read it, and uh, one of the girls was saying, like, oh, my God, because we had Wonder Twins. We had Challenge of the Super Friends on. They were like, oh, the Wonder sure. Twins. Yeah, don't show that. Uh, don't show anything past that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and she's like, oh, man. Did you? And I was like, did you? She's like, I love the Wonder Twins and how ridiculous they are. I'm like, have you been reading DC vs. Vampires? Because there's that great Wonder Twins joke. And she's like, oh, man, that joke. That was hard and beautiful and hilarious <laughs> all at the same time. So if you're not reading it, I strongly recommend that you read DC vs. Vampires. Also read the Wonder Twins series. Yeah, the, the, uh, the what was it, Wonder Comics Twins? Yes. The Wonder Comics Wonder Twins? Also, it is a different, it was a different artist yes, on thank issue you. three. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, we've got In His Own Image from Source Point Press. This is issue two. I'm a, I'll let you do this one. <laughs> um, I don't know what you can show on the inside job. I think there's some pages that aren't, like, super, like, I don't know. I can't remember what the inside completely looks like, but uh, you'll figure it out. I'll pick and choose. Um, In His Own Image is, we talked about this book last month when it first came out. This is kind of the story of um, that world where we have the ability to have anything we want in the world and the one thing we want is to cause other people pain and a company has created the ability for people to do that and in issue one we saw a guy buy a, a robot and essentially just continuously torture this robot in different ways until the robot died and uh we start to see <laughs> this robot come back <laughs> for vengeance and um and you know, Phil and I talked about it on last issue. We were like, wow, that was really, really, really violent. And I don't know if this book is for me. But we feel like there's probably a point where they're going to, like, make a point in what they're doing. And I can see after reading issue two how they're moving towards that. See, I, I, oh, I can't. Oh, I did. I didn't. Because of the fact that in this one they show that the way the company brought 
the way that you see the backstory of the company kind of coming into what it is. Oh, yeah, I see. And and you see them working, you know, they you see them testing on animals and you see the way that the the animals kind of lash, lash, lash out at them for what's happening and the chain, the way that that affects them and 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 so you are going to eventually get to this point I believe where we're going to see that the way that violence like comes about it that's what's in his own image is that we are consistently creating this violence and we are breeding violence mm-hmm. and all of the things that we do are kind of bringing us to that it is still very violent this is in that situation and and dark this is one of those comics that kind of falls in with those you you know you see those movies that you're like this is really hard to watch but i know that it had a point and you kind of get the point by the end and you're like but that was so i don't ever need to see it again Yes. But I, like, appreciate what they were saying. This is definitely one of those comics that kind of falls into a lot of that category where it's, like, if you find those movies hard to watch, you might find a lot of this comic hard to read. Um, but if you enjoy those movies that are really, really dark versions of of stories to get you to that commentary, you're going to love it. I know, uh, you know, Matt and Nigel read this right after we said it was a lot, and they both were like, oh, man, that was so good. And so it, it does, like, if you are, if you fall, find yourself enjoying movies like that, you are actually going to, to like this because it is, it is building towards a point. And, and at this, after reading issue two, I'm, I'm curious enough to see what that point is. Um, and it's, and, and I want to see, I kind of want to see where they go with it. And if they make the point solid enough for what they did to get there. That's kind of where I'm at. Like, do you, do you, is your point going to be like, because you said, like you just said, you couldn't see that they were building towards a point. So now I'm curious to see if like when they do hit the point, is it going to be like noticeable enough that they were doing something to build a point and not just being yeah violent for violence sake? Uh, I mean, I, I will admit I'm jumping off at this issue. I will not be yeah. continuing on because where I, it, I felt kind of... <laughs> Like, that first issue kind of felt like watching, like, a hostel movie. It did. Where you're like, I don't really need to see this. But this one features animal abuse. Mm-hmm. And that's even harder for me to sit mm-hmm. through. And so I just remember, like, finishing this issue and being in a very negative headspace. And I was like, okay. Like, I understand that, you know, sometimes you use violence to drive home a point. But I have, I have limits. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you far exceeded... My, you've got past my limits. And that's why I'm curious to see if they'll actually make, like, stick a landing. Like, not necessarily that I need to read it to mm-hmm. see that, but that I'm curious to see if they will, because like you said, they're going so far on all, like, like pushing the buttons on mm-hmm. the violence. So I'm curious to see if, like, they do what what their message ends up, fall, like, landing as yes. because of that. Um, If there is one. Um, But I know, like, a lot of people talk about, like, oh, I didn't like Saw because it was violent and it seemed like it was just violent. Because I said that originally. Like, I was like, oh, I don't like Saw. And I've never gone back and watched them because I saw the first one. I was like, it was just a lot of violence. But a lot of people right. talk about it as, like, no, this is the reasons for the violence and this is what it meant and this, that. And I was like, I just never needed to go back and and, and watch them. Right. Like, I, okay, I understand your point. I yeah. just don't need to see that. I don't need, yeah. like, show me in a, you know... With something less messed up. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, this this book and was a, a bit too much for me. It's intense. And that and it, it now has a warning on it. It needs It did to. not have a warning on issue one, but issue two does have a this is mature content. Um, I definitely think that issue two does try to build the story more than yes. issue one, where you just saw the violence, and that's why I think that we're going to see uh, something come from this. But... Um, I'm just curious what that something's going to be. Yeah, like, I, I think the violence is, is toned down. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't see it as much in this one. I think it's just the little that you do see for me, where it's like, oh, lot. this this is too much. Yeah, and, like, the beginning, you know, I see Matt over there shaking his head, and, like, yeah, that beginning part, I'm like, okay, cool. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. And then after that, I'm like, okay, this really sucks. Because yeah. I'm sad. Because <laughs> <don't... laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> right. So if you want a comic that's going to make you go through all of the emotions, in his own image, is definitely one of them. Um, on the complete happier end of the spectrum, uh, Merlin and Hector, issue three from Stonebot, which is an imprint of, of Red Five, which we have been talking about how much we love Stonebot. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, this is this is a magical fantasy story about some kids. Uh, we've got a, a young boy named Merlin who is destined to be the greatest magical u- magic user in all of time. And he has been joined on this quest. And he doesn't know that. He just thinks he's like a sheep herder. And he is brought onto this quest by another boy and who's he catches stealing a pig and they end up on this quest together and now people are after them. All kinds of things are happening. They've now teamed up with a girl who is one of the daughters of the moon and she is she's the, she's the shape shifter eventually or essentially and they've gone through all of these incredible journeys just in that first three issues. This is the end of the arc. Oh, uh, it's wow. only going to be three issues for this arc. And they kind of resolve, you know, get to a resolution and then kind of build up to the fact that this is going to be the end of the arc. Um, possibly could also, if you really just wanted a really open ending, you could also just leave it there. Um, because they, the way they wrap it up towards the end, uh, they make like a one-off comment about where the future might lead them. And I was like, oh, I finally get what we're doing here. Uh, like, I just thought we were on a cool adventure. But now I, I'm i with you, Merlin and Hector. So they could leave it. I hope they don't. Because uh, I fell more in love with the characters as we got closer to the end of this issue. And I hope we get to see more. And also, I just love this art of these. This, this is like perfect fantasy art to me. I mean, I will say I think the one thing that Stonebot has been destroying it on is the artwork. Mm-hmm. It is so impressive. I love looking at these pages. I'm not even reading this book, but I'm sitting here looking at this art. Um, it gives me, I think I've said this before when we talked about the last issue, kind of like the Mignola vibes. Mm-hmm. And I'd actually be okay with that because, you know, going back to the Mignola verse, I mean, there's a lot of the the uh, lobster johnson in particular but they do it with hellboy as well where it's a lot of just like three or four issue stories yeah that they kind of just interweave an overarching story in the background kind of sort of um but I- i'm totally okay with that idea if you want to like do an adventure and then we jump forward in time or backward yeah. in time and you want to do another three or four issues i, I say go for it um, I mean, yeah, this artwork looks, it looks fantastic. It's so good. Uh, Stonebot, keep it up, man. This is a great, like, yes. great first wave of books from this imprint with, uh, that we're seeing, and I absolutely can't wait to see more from Stonebot. Yes. I was, I was telling Dan that I think, uh, who does Bigfoot Knows Karate, that I'd love to see his book on a Stonebot, uh, he could, in the Stonebot universe. Yeah, he could definitely... Yeah. Uh, definitely get up there with some of the, the art and those. Um, and it would fit, too, with the vibe with of the those vibe. books. Most yeah. definitely. Absolutely. If you haven't read Bigfoot Knows Karate uh, by Dan Price, you totally should. We have some in the store. Um, the last session, issue four from Mad Cave. I love bringing out books from Mad Cave because there's not enough of them. Uh, this is the story of a group of people who all ended up kind of breakfast club style and like a detention style room in their high school. And while they were sitting there waiting for whatever was supposed to actually happen, they all started talking about how they were learning about D&D and hearing about that for the first time. And so they create a D&D group and... Then they go off to college, and as per usual with any role-playing games, they never actually finish their game. And now they're all about to graduate college and move off into the different places, and so they've decided they need to come together and finish their campaign. So they are playing the last session of this campaign, and uh, they're getting together each week to kind of like try to finish this campaign off. But their dungeon master in the course of college has gotten a new partner he's in a relationship and he's so excited about his girl getting to meet all of his friends so he's like hey why don't you play the game with them and of course the friends are like what we're in this like we're almost done like this is weird you can't bring somebody else in and uh you got the friends who are welcoming and you got the friends who don't want to see somebody else add and you got the friends who are adamantly against it and are just hating it 
what I love about this book is it's half told in real life and half them like figuring their shit out while they're playing the game. So their characters in the game are arguing while they're supposed to be fighting like the necromancer <laughs> or whatever they're going against. Uh, so it's a super, super awesome, super fun a uh, story that kind of blends a little bit of fantasy into that reality. And um, this particular issue is really great because we see things kind of like blow up within the group and just how that group dynamic and how friendships really work. And this is a great friendship story. Um, if you haven't picked it up yet, we have issues one through four now. So I recommend that you check it out because it's, it's a really good, really good friend story. Yeah, I'm especially if you like D and D. I mean, I've always, I've always enjoyed because I, I, I'll even watch YouTube videos of people playing D and D, because I'm like, this is just, it's fun to watch. So you put it in a comic book, it's better. Because <laughs> then you can read it. Uh, Animal Castle issue four from a Blaze Comics. This is almost, I guess, you could actually. Call possibly call it a sequel to Animal Farm. And I say that now because in this particular issue, they say, remember what happened when the pigs took over. Oh. And so yeah. I was like, oh, we are actually doing a sequel essentially to Animal Farm because they're like, this is what, these were supposed to be the people who liberated us from the pigs. So it went from a farm to, to a, a castle. castle. Mm. And, and which is why it's more intense, <laughs> I guess, than mm -hmm. Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you've ever read the novel Animal Farm, this is a great, uh, companion to it, like I really think that schools should give you the option of which one to read or assign or both, both in conjunction yeah. with each other in the future. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous story. We see, uh, you know, the the dogs and uh, the bull running this this castle of animals, and all of the animals have their assigned jobs that they have to work. And at this point, they've decided that they needed to start a revolution uh, away from this because it's just the unlivable conditions. They're being mistreated. People, if you step, if you say anything or do anything against the dogs or the leader, uh, you're just killed. And we've seen it in the book and we've seen how crazy it can get. And so we've got a, the last female cat um, in the entire, the entire, she's actually the last adult cat in general, but she's the last female cat and she's kind of starting to wake up to what's going on and decides that she doesn't think that that's how it should work and that, that people need to do something. And so she is very timidly kind of at this point helping lead this revolution. Um, and it talks about, you know, we've got it in this issue, particularly they talk about, you know, it's the small things that you do. If you go after these large forces with your violence, you're going to lose mm -hmm. because they are the bigger, stronger beings. And they're like, okay, well, then we need to do these big things. And she's like, no, we need to do a small thing. Like the fact that it's winter and in this issue, they collect all of the firewood and then it all gets put in a storage unit and then they have to buy the firewood they collected. Wow. And... It's like, well, why are we paying for the wood that we, why can't we just keep some of the wood that we collect? Why do we have to collect all the wood to be used for you and then we can buy it back from you? Right. And why are we doing all the work and you're getting all of the benefit and then we have to pay for those things? So what if we just didn't buy any wood? And they're like, well, won't we freeze? And, you know, she's like, yeah, yeah, we probably will. But we hit them where it matters. We mm -hmm. don't spend our money there. And so this entire issue is the animals trying to make that little step mean something huge and seeing how the leader, the leader responds to it and how the, the dogs, number one and number two, like how they respond to, to trying to like explain to the leader what's happening. And then like, he's like, well, what do you want us to, what do you, what are you going to do about it? And they're like, well, if we do anything, we lose our best workers. We can't kill them. They're the best workers. We can't you know, throw them out into the cold specifically so they'll freeze. But, like, maybe we should make it harder for them to stay warm and then they'll come to us and buy stuff. Like, we have to make them cave. And so you see all of that very much like you did in Animal Farm. Um, it's honestly so much easier to digest what's happening than, than even reading Animal Farm. Like, I read Animal Farm multiple times throughout my literary career. And so, you know... Each time you, of course, pick up things and you learn more things because you grow older. But now reading this with the art going with it and the way it's written, I'm like, oh, I get 
everything, somehow I now know everything that had happened in Animal Farm that I never got before. Right. Uh, absolutely beautiful story. Great job. Uh, I can't wait to see how it plays out. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of those where it's just really well done. I mean, you're talking about a book from the writing to the art. Everything fits perfectly. I, I mean, I agree this should be shown in schools mm -hmm. um, because it is. And and like you said, I, I do think, I, I mean, I've I read Animal Farm in high school. I loved Animal Farm, but it's also a book that I've never thought to go back to. Um, because I remember what it took for me to get through that book. Mm -hmm. Um, and I could read this over and over again. Over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's four issues in. I, I know that first issue is tough to get your hands on. We might have second print okay. still of the first issue though, so. Um, does that book go to a third print for sure? I don't think so. Maybe. But, uh, I definitely went to a second print. You I don't think see we that off the window, boys. No, not at all with those small press books. So... Uh, up next is Sensation Comics, uh, Sensation Comics, Sensational Wonder Woman special. Oh my gosh, that was hard to get to because it is the 80th anniversary of Sensation Comics. Mm. So we, uh, you know, Wonder Woman came out 80 years ago last year. Sensation Comics, which is the main title that she ran through, actually started in 1942. And this is, uh... This is the kind of celebration, like we always see the, you know, the 80th anniversary issues that we do. Um, they did one for action and they did one for detective. And Wonder Woman got an 80th anniversary for Wonder Woman last right. year, but it's actually not until now that we have that. Uh, and because they didn't call it, it's not the 80th anniversary of Wonder Woman, there wasn't really a lot of fanfare towards this one. Um, because it is just the 80th of the title. So, uh... It's it's kind of sad that we didn't get, like, a huge, huge thing. Uh, Chad's asking if Lantern Joe is there prominently or just a panel or two. I don't know because I only got through the first story um, of this issue. I'm not going to lie. There is a lot, of, a lot of different stories in this one. I read the first one, which is all about a little boy who dresses up like Wonder Woman for Superhero Day at school. Um, the full Wonder Woman suit, the crown, the gloves, like, or the, the gauntlets, the skirt, everything. And all of the other boys at school make fun of him. And they tell him, you're not even good enough to be a girl hero. You're just a loser. And, oh, my God, I can't believe you dress like a girl. And they're picking on him for wearing a skirt to school. And then a villain attacks. And Wonder Woman ends up coming, you know, to the area to save the day. And the little boy who's just as Wonder Woman ends up helping the kid that's the biggest bully, you know, get to safety. And when he meets Wonder Woman in the process, Wonder Woman is, when he's watching Wonder Woman fight this person, and Wonder Woman's telling the villain, like, look, you're doing this because your father was this villain, and you've taken up this moniker because you don't know what else to do with your life. So you've just decided, like, you need to become a villain because mm -hmm. that's what you are. She's like, but you're smarter than that, and you're good at this. Like, you're good at making tech. Like, why don't you do this? Like, why don't you find out who you are and do something that makes you comfortable in your own skin? And Wonder Woman ends up coming up to the little boy at the end to say, like, are you okay? Thank you for your help kind of thing. You know how she always does with the super, mm -hmm. the kids who help. And the little boy tells Wonder Woman, you know, I heard you tell the superhero that they need to be more comfortable with who they are, or the villain, they need to be more comfortable with who they are. What if who you are is more comfortable like this? Like, what if I'm more comfortable being dressed in clothes like this than I am dressing like myself? What am I more comfortable making myself look like you? And Wonder Woman says, then you're going to need a better crown. And she takes off her tiara and she gives it to the little boy. Aww. And I was like, well, I can't read any more of this book because I'm already crying. So <laughs> this book is great. It's wonderful. I made it through one story without cry with, and, and then cried. Um, so you're on your own for the rest of the stories because I could. I was like, I've already cried at enough comics this week. I can't cry at any more comics this week. That's fair. Uh, it's fantastic. I can't wait, but I am curious to see what other characters who have had time in Sensation Comics do show up in this series. What was her first, uh, this... her first appearance was the fifth one? Sensation 5? Her first appearance was in Justice League. All or All-Star Star Comics. Yeah, it was oh, Justice it's League. Yeah, All-Star 6, and it's the Justice League table. Yeah, like, yeah, right. yeah, she didn't come in. Sensation came after her first appearance. That's why last year was her 80th, and this is her... 
Oh. Last year was Wonder Woman's 80th, was and this first. is the 80th of no All Star Comics was first. Mm. Um, up next is the Headset Binge Book Number One, which I know neither of us actually got to read, but I wanted to throw it in here because I didn't read all of it. But this is what if you were a fourth grader, you're a ninth grade kid, a fourteen year old, a ninth grader who suddenly has the ability to like read minds and uh miss uh like mentally control people so and things so you never miss it. it's basically all of these kids suddenly become telepathic and they're dealing with all of the ninth grade drama while also being uh uh telepathic and it is from a small press brain hole oh, no, no, no no it's uh i don't know who the publisher is on it now that i said that um sitcoms sitcoms presents that yeah so some ninth grade I, I, you know we don't bring a lot of the like kids book and YA books out here but since this one came out as an individual like kind of almost trade size but not quite a full graphic novel size i thought it was super cool this is a number one it's 4.99 and it's 68 pages which is huge yeah I, it is a nice oversized book i like the art this is kind of cool yeah it, it definitely, and we need to see more of that, that age. Cause you know, we see a lot of the 11 year olds and the 12 year olds, like starting like middle school. And we see a lot of the people coming towards the end of their high school career. So it's kind of nice to see these kids who are in that ninth grade, like, oh my God, I'm still kind of a kid, but I want to be an adult. And now I have telepathic powers. So what do I do? Uh, super cute. I'll root for any kid that wears a turtleneck. And the best. With a vest. <laughs> That's the kid I'd root for. It looks like you, Matt. <laughs> Were you chubby as a kid? No. Oh. Never ever. Happened. No. Uh, Something is Killing the Children is back. This is issue 21 of Something is Killing the Children. Why are you showing them? Because I don't want to take them out of the beautiful packaging. Oh, they're packaged? Oh, they're in bags and boards because the covers are black. Ooh. Uh, I know. You want to show off the Ginny Prison one. The Ricardi one. Uh, the Ricardi one, I don't think we have any more of, do what? we? We had one. Um, well, either way, Something is Killing Children is back. We, uh, Matt, you can go, you can look at the different covers. Uh, we've got the return of, of this world. We've kind of been on a break while, uh. There's two in my box that are back and board. Sorry. Uh, I want to show We've okay. been, okay. <laughs> we've been on a don't break. We've been on a break for something that's killing the children for a minute since volume four when we found out, like, the, the world expanded. We found out there was there was a whole much, whole, whole, whole bunch more than just Erica Slaughter fighting monsters going on in this world. And House of Slaughter's kind of help us expand on this a little bit, but we are going even further uh, with a new story arc in this. And still just need you to see this Jenny Frizen cover uh, to be happy. Yes. I love it. Yeah. I like gimmicky covers. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Uh, Close it up. I, huh? Close it back up. Right. Show that off. Uh, that's cool. Uh, BJ just said, you have a black cover. I want it. I think I put all of the covers in your box, BJ. I will double check and see. Uh, but that beautiful Ginny Frizen one where where she has that. And there's two different variants. There's the non-bloody and the bloody version of that die cut. Oh, I was like... Why are there two in my yeah, box? I was like, why Everybody you put two in my that. box? Okay. Everybody said that. They were like, why do I have two of these? And I was like, because one of them she's covered in blood and one of them she's not. So, uh, and we're not going to show you anything inside this book. I just needed you to know that it came back this week in our oh, little, it, like, number one. Can't? I just don't want you to. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a secret. But, I mean, you could probably show, like, a page like that. I don't know. Matt's, Matt's gone. So while he's no, gone, I, you, you could show what? something. Because I don't think he's read it yet. I'll, uh, I'll stick to uh, uh, honoring what y'all said. I mean, I don't know. He said don't show the art. So I didn't know if that was, like, on purpose. That's what he said when he went to go get yours. So I don't know if he meant just until he got back or in general. Uh, well, we're not going to show it. So we won't show it. If you have not started reading Some of These Killing the Children by now. You need to. And I, there is a new person every day of the week. Every day of the oh, week, somebody else so. jumps on something that's killing the children, and I am so happy to uh, help that happen. So. I'm reading it in trades, unless there's a frizzing cover. Um, I'm on the third trade. I like it. I really like it. I think I understand why everyone loves this book mm -hmm. so much. Um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but 
I, I get why everyone loves it. And it's really like that fourth trade mm. that really I like... Down there yet. I know, that's what I'm saying. That's where the universe blows up, so that's what makes everything. Then I'm going to come in and be like, oh my god. I've been obsessed with something that's killing the children. Yes. I want all the covers. Yeah. I try to get you as many of I'm those trying, shitty prisons. Yeah. I'm, sh- I'm trying hard. Because right now it seems like everyone is trying to build universes. Yes. And I don't have the attention span for that. <laughs> You know, there's a reason I only read Hawks Pox and nothing beyond <laughs> that with X Men because I'm like, there's already too much going on. I'm already confused by who all these people are. Um, so I think that's the one reason why I'm taking my time because, you know, I know that the world is going to expand outwards and I'm not ready for it. Yeah. Uh, next we have Zombies versus Robots Part One. Um, and this is the Zombies vs. Robots Classics. It's yes. from Image, but it is on the new Image imprint that I can't say. Oh, so, yes. The one that Rain is on. Mm. And they I know don't... that nobody can say it. It's like a mixture of different letters. and uh, They I do can't... it on purpose. They do. They literally said, we don't know how to say it either, like in their letter or something like that. We know that you can't say it. But is it ZBRC? No, that's Zombies vs. Mm-hmm. Robots Classic. Yeah, that's the title. Short Robots Yes. Yes. Um, and this is... And so I think this is basically, because you were talking about you think this is reprints. It is. This is the like equivalent of Taylor Swift re-releasing all of her albums. Yes. So that she owns the creative rights. That's what this is. Yes. So originally Zombies vs. Robots came out in like 2007. Uh, it was actually an IDW book. Um, and it's just kind of been one of those like under the radar cult classic books that a lot of people just really love. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> I read bits and pieces of it back in the day when it was coming out. I thought the Ashley Wood art was just really captivating for me. Um, but I think this is a great way to do this. It's almost like a director's cut. Um, you're going to get all new covers um, for each issue. But it's basically just like expanding on that initial run. Yes. Um, giving you a little bit more. They're adding some stuff that maybe wasn't in there originally. Um, Because I know, like, right right off the bat, I know it's like the first page or two is is added on. Um, But it's just kind of a great way to get into this series um, and start from number one without having to go back and track down all that other stuff. Um, Or if you're just a fan of uh, Zombies vs. Robots, um, which the book is is pretty much that. Yeah. Like... There's a lot of sciencey stuff going on behind it, but the thing that you really need to take away from this is that it's zombies, zombies versus, versus robots. robots. Um, and it's good. It's I think it's it's a fun book. Um, if you like this, I think you should go back and check out all the other stuff because I've heard nothing but like really great things. Like I have friends who live and die by this book, where it's like in their top five books ever. Oh, wow. Because they it just hits home with them. And, and a lot of people that I've talked to that read this one was like, oh, this is even better because you're kind of expanding on it. And I think, so it's only going to be four issues, but I do think that they are going to also tell, um, I think they're going to add some stuff to the universe as well. Um, but yeah, definitely pick this up. Yeah, absolutely. And it is on our wall, so if you want to come in and check it out. Um, and check out Rain on their imprint from Image uh, if you haven't checked it out yet. Oh, yeah, I want to see what, I want to see, uh, what it, it's called. If it called. says what the name of the imprint is. So, there it is. Syzygy. So, 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 Spell it. S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. S-Y-Z-Y. Yeah, because at the bottom it says the Cis age continues. Yeah, Syzygy. Syzygy. Uh, and that is uh, Chris Rael and Ashley Rael and Ashley Woods imprint in image. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's their imprint, I believe. That's cool. Yeah. So we're gonna see a lot of Ashley Wood art in this Probably imprint. Probably so. Ooh. All right, Sizzle G. <laughs> you send me a T-shirt. <laughs> He's like, I'm wearing it every day. You got me with the Ashley Wood art. Uh, next up from Keen Spot, we have issue one of Quintara Stone, which I totally skipped. Uh, sorry, didn't give you this. This, uh, but I thought of it when the incentive, we actually have the one in eight incentive cover on our wall. And, uh, one of our customers yesterday was like, what is that? 
My favorite thing that they did with this is that they actually printed all of the covers on the back of the book with cover A, cover B, cover C, and then like who the artist is. So I don't have to wonder who uh, and which cover they are. So super helpful for me right there. Everybody should take that on because when I'm putting pulling people's picks uh, at the beginning of the week and I got to know which covers which and it's like, oh, well, we actually changed it. So what was listed as cover A originally is now cover C and the barcodes don't match and all this stuff. It's just easier. Uh, but this is essentially the story. It's kind of like a, it feels very Battle Popish, uh, or, uh, what's the, the Aurelia, the nun? Oh, the, it yeah. feels like that. That's, that's another the really good, nun. warrior nun. Thank you. Um, this is a girl who is a part of like the Knights Templar, essentially back in, in that time period. And they're protecting the Holy Grail and, the uh, people come for the whole, like these demons come for the Holy Grail and the only way for them to survive is basically to drink the blood out of the Holy Grail and get the powers and nobody wants to do it, but she does. And we're seeing that run at the same time as her in the modern time. And I'm not sure if she's a good guy or a bad guy in the modern time. I can't tell if she's a thief um, or if she is working to stop them. So it's kind of left ambiguous, ambiguous on purpose. Like she goes on a mission and she's like, Ooh, well, let's see if this is worth all the fuss. But you like, don't know if she was trying to stop the bad guys from getting it or if she is like the bad guy trying mm. to get it. So I kind of like it because you don't know where this character falls at all, but we do know her backstory is that when everybody else was like, no, this is not what you should do. You should not drink the blood because saving ourselves isn't what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to die for this cause. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to drink this. Like, <laughs> and I'm going to go live another day. And now she's living thousands of years later and she's still, who knows? Maybe a good guy, maybe a bad guy. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. It is definitely not like. This is a fun book. Like, it's not mm. like you're sitting there like, oh, this is a lot to take in. I don't really know where it's going. Like, I got to think it through. This is kind of just like the warrior nun kind of thing. Like, oh, this is a girl that's going to kind of beat, beat the crap out of people and do some cool stuff. Uh, and she's been doing it for centuries. So let's see where it goes. What's up? What are you looking for? Is his name Greg Bo? Yes. Greg Bo Watson. Greg Bo Watson. What a name. Yeah. I don't know. It had a lot of really cool covers, and I ordered one of each. So Well, I saw, I think the thing for the, the black and white cover that you have up there, yes, the one and eight. one and eight. I think because of the Moon Knight TV show, mm -hmm. a few people came in, and because uh, I was standing there, and people were looking at it, I was like, oh, is this a new Moon Knight book? I'm like, no, it's yeah. called Something Stone. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, because she has like an Assassin's Creed, yeah. Knights Templar-y kind of outfit on, so I can see that. Um Huh? That's a Moon Knight outfit with a red mask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Basically. Uh, we saw the end of My Date with Monsters, uh, issue five from Aftershock this week. Uh, this is Paul Tobin's not bunny mask title. Uh, this is the story of a woman who managed to find a way to bring nightmares to life in our world on accident. And every time somebody would fall asleep, has a bad dream, those nightmares become monsters in the real world. And she needs to figure out how to stop that from happening. At the same time, we see the government also trying to stop it. So they've created pills that like won't let you fall asleep, like won't help you dream. And she did a, uh, and, and the government has created a section of the military that instead of learning how to fight is actually learning how to fall, like get her to fall in love with them because they need somebody to fall in love with her so that the, her daughter will stop having bad dreams because her daughter's dreams are the only ones they can't stop. Uh, crazy book. Lots of crazy stuff happens. Uh, it's, it's Paul Tobin. So like it just keeps going in weirder and weirder directions mm -hmm. as the story goes. But it's really well written, and this could potentially be the entire end. Uh, it sounds like it from Paul Tobin's letter, but it is mm. open enough that we could possibly see a volume two. So if he ever like wants to come back to it, he could. Yes. We did not solve all of the problems necessarily, but we did figure out a lot of like philosophical approaches to it. Okay. Very Paul Tobin uh, answer, and I love it. I love this book. I think it's perfect. Like at issue five, I don't think we ever need to come back to it. Uh, it's got a, just enough of that like open modern ending 
where it's like, oh, I can figure out where it's going from here. Like, I don't need you to right. go back and tell me the more of the story. But, like, if you ever, like you said, wanted to pick it up and do, like, a something completely different oh. within that same world, it's there. But it's absolutely fun to read. If you didn't read it, we have issues one through five. Uh, and it's Aftershock, so it won't take too long for a trade to come, probably. Uh, the Heathens, issue five from Aftershock, also wrapping up this week. This is the end of the Cullen Bunn book about a bunch of kind of literary characters, kind of historical fiction, like historical characters all mixed up. Some of them are fiction characters. Some of them are like supposed to represent possibly real people um, that all want to fight their way out of hell, essentially, by working for... Uh, this mission and if they can stop the mission they can make it out of they can be redeemed we'll see if they did you have to read it there's five issues of it and this is at least the end of this arc who knows if we'll see more uh is this the only i feel like we haven't talked about colin bunn in a minute we haven't we have not had a lot of colin bunn it's been a there's been a little bit of other than last book you'll ever read we've kind of seen a little bit of a break on the colin bunn oversaturation this, this art looks cool though i like the art in this book that's the thing Colin Bunn always teams up with pretty solid artists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm kind of glad that he's, you know, toned down. Absolutely, because when he takes project. his time and he rolls through the stories, he's yeah. really good. But when he does too many at one time, they kind of feel like he rushed over them. And mm -hmm. they either don't end at all or they end not as good as they started. Yeah. So maybe the fact that we're seeing less books from Colin Bunn means that we're going to see some really great books from Colin Bunn. Yeah, maybe he just needed to get all these mini series off his chest. Where he's like, I just really need to tell the story before I can move into my Magnus Opus. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Uh, and lastly, we have issue one of Season of the Bruja, uh, a book from Oni Press that I have been waiting for for so long. Uh, when they first announced this book, I got super freaking excited, and I am still super excited. Um, this is, it's kind of very Oni Press feeling, like yes. you get a little bit of like a, a, that Scott Pilgrim vibey kind of situation with the way the characters talk to each other and the way the art looks. Um, but this is the story of a young girl who, her, she's the, the next girl in a line of the Latinx family, so she, and her grandma is a bruja. And so she is learning to take that role and responsibility on and we see her fighting against a demon and breaking every rule she's ever been told about how to do it and they she knows that and she's telling us she's the one telling us she's breaking all of the yeah. rules and then you see her go home and have the conversation with her grandma about how she broke all of the rules and you get the the lecture and you get all of those moments you get all the lighthearted and, you know, heavy moments all mixed in together. It's really great the way the, the character dynamics are already built out in the mm -hmm. very first issue. Um, and and then, you know, you some stuff happens that I, like, it escalates quickly. Um, yes. And I want to see how this is going to play out. This is such, it's, I have a feeling, like, uh, Shadecraft and some of the other books that we've seen recently that are about the you know, generational family right. magic. We're going to see an absolutely beautiful story. A Mamo, another great one of the mm -hmm. grandmother leading, leaving, leaving the magic, like responsibilities to the person that's underneath them. Um, I can't wait to see how this book's going to play out. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, the art, the colors and the story and the character relationships are already very well done. And I'm, ex I'm excited for it. Yeah. I was really impressed with this one. Um, uh, the art especially it's definitely one of those art styles that i do really enjoy um it's it's an oni press book mm -hmm. and if you've read an oni press book then you've seen art like this before um but i like there's a lot of really wonderful things in here like when they turn into animals yeah. and um i love i love the relationship between her and her grandma absolutely it's it's just wonderful i, I do i think this book is going to have so much depth to it um but it's also going to be really fun um, <clears throat> along the way. Almost kind of like um, uh, a little bit of like Sabrina. Yes. And the way that, that she kind of acts where she, you know, a little quirky mm -hmm. um, and fun. There's jokes there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I I think this is going to be a great book. Um, yeah. And I'm really, like, I, I'm, Witches is not even one of those things that like I've ever been a big fan of. Um, probably outside of Sabrina the Teenage Wish growing up. 
um, in that one movie, that one Disney movie. I don't know what it's called. The Witches. No, 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 no there's another one. I have to look it up. I was like, there are a lot of Disney movies about witches. <laughs> yeah, I think from Witch Mountain. <sighs> No, I, I don't know. It could be the witches. I'd have to see. It, I'd, I'd that have was to see a, the cover of the that was the DVD. The Angelica Huston one. That's super scary. The Roald Dahl movie. Oh no no no! I didn't see that one. Yeah, because so. uh, I remember that. I remember everyone saying that movie was really scary. It's it's a little scary for kids. It's a little traumatizing. Our cat loves it though because they turn them into mice, and so the and then the mice are made by Jim Henson. Mm. So the cat loves it because these are like some of the most realistic maybe, mice on the maybe it was the one. screen. But uh, I I love witches. I love everything witches. I I absolutely can't wait. And you know, growing up like in in a Latinx household with my grandma, uh, you know, always yelling at us and then telling us all the things like if you don't do this, like this is gonna happen. If you don't do this, this is gonna happen. Um, and seeing her do you know, get the egg and, and roll it over people and take the ojo out of them and, and then say you have to take this egg and you have to do this, this, this. Like, you see all of this and you talk about the brujas and you talk about the magic within that culture. And so I can't wait to see um, to see how this plays out because it's going to be an absolutely beautiful story. And um, it's I love seeing that from from my my grandma and my my family from from that side. And um I, I can't wait to see. Like, this to me is like if my little sister would have actually become, like, m- like would have c- gone in this path. Like, if my grandma had uh-huh. actually been, like, more into the, like, bruja magic and, and then was like, okay, Samantha, now it's you. Because my sister is one of those uh, people who's, who, who's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do all the things. And then, like, completely does the opposite of what she just said she was going to do. And then it becomes, like, a big mess. Uh, sorry if you're watching, uh, Samantha. Because she does. But I, she, like, could, I could see her. And then, like, makes the joke about it. Like, well, what did you want me to do? Yeah. Like, I don't know. And so she has a very similar personality to my sister. Um, who, my sister, her hero, is my grandma. So I can see this oh, okay. being, like, a really cool, uh, beautiful story for, for my sister um, to read. And I... I I'm so excited to like share that one with her at some point, but it's, it's absolutely great. And I can't wait to see where this goes. Yes. Also the movie was Hocus Pocus. Hmm. Yes. That makes sense. That's the one I remember as a kid. That makes sense. A lot of sense. All right. Uh, reminder, if you didn't already vote, we are doing, I gave them to you. Uh, we are doing the last round of our best of 2021. If you didn't vote for those already, you can still vote for them. It is down between uh, some, uh, House of Slaughter, the mini series, and uh, Mini Deaths of Layla Star. So if you haven't voted already, there's still time. We're going to talk about in comic news which one of those books wins best book of 2021, according to you. <clears throat> Um, I believe House of Slaughter is up by one now, but I don't think that you voted. I think I went back and looked. You should double check, but I don't think that you did. Um, and I'll actually, I'll check while Sorry. you're talking about this because we're going to talk picks of the week, and the first one is yours. Oh, well, all right. Well, perfect. You can look, <laughs> I'll and look I will talk, talk about the glorious uh, Hulk Grand Design. They have returned with the Grand Design series. If you have not checked any of them out um ed piscor did uh two volumes of x-men grand design uh tom skilly did fantastic four grand design and now we get jim rug uh doing uh the hulk uh the thing about these books in particular is it's basically they are going to condense the entire story of these characters into a few issues um with the x-men stuff uh ed piscor kind of focused on like key storylines from x-men uh jim rug is going to go through the hulk from the very beginning to present day um and kind of do like a homage to the silver age artwork um i'm this is uh, this is a pick of the week mainly just because i love jim rug um he's one half of the cartoonist kayfabe guys um very talented artist huge fan of the art form and I just, I want to promote these books because I want Marvel to do more stuff like this, where it's like, hey, let's give some of these underground guys a chance. Let's give some of these cartoonists a chance. I mean, it's just, this artwork is wonderful. Um, it's exactly what I, like, now I want him to draw his own Hulk book. Um, 
It's it's great. So this is you're gonna. This book starts with the origin story. That first issue, it goes through. You're gonna get the the Doc Samson shows up in this, and you get to see a great battle. There's a lot of you know Silver Surfer. He draws pretty much all the big Marvel characters in this book, and it's just so much fun to look at. After um, so I went to the Sean Murphy signing mm-hmm. with. Uh, two other um, subscribers here, uh, J2 and, and Chad, who's probably in the comments. And I went first, and I hadn't been to the comic shop all week. Um, and the moment that I finished talking to... Uh, yeah, there's Doc Samson. The moment I stopped talking to Sean Murphy, I ran out of line and immediately went straight to the Marvel section just to look um, at the interior of this book, because I knew it was going to be something special. Um, I also, when this book was announced, when Jib Rug mentioned that he was doing it on Cartoonist Kayfabe, I messaged Shannon and was like, I want every cover for this book. Um, I want to support this book as much as possible. Um, and it's a great way to, you know, learn about, um, yeah, look at this. There he is. Kicking Modog. Look at that art. It's just, it's great artwork. But this is like, if you don't want to go back and read, you know, was it 60 years now? worth of of hulk stories read this and you'll get the gist and hopefully you know it'll give you know jim rug fans people who may be more into the underground cartoon side of of comics who may now all of a sudden start reading marvel books because they're like oh my favorite artist is doing a big two book this could get people into hulk um because i think hulk is a really awesome character um, but yeah, definitely pick this up. It's going to be a lot of fun. And again, you're going to get a very condensed version of the Hulk. Um, with Jim Rogart. You can't be like, that's, that's winning all around. Did I vote? You did vote. Um, uh, I know I, I was going to say, I don't know. I'm tagging him, uh, and hit right now, but, uh, BJ has been in all of the votes so far, and I saw him in the comments earlier, so I just wanted to say, BJ, you haven't voted if you're still watching between Layla Star and House of Slaughter. If you're voting for House of Slaughter, though, just don't vote. <laughs> Phil's campaigning for his uh, for his choice, but... Uh, I, I would put issue three of Layla Star up against the entire House of Slaughter stuff. I would think that... I wouldn't be surprised if issue three of Layla Star wins an Eisner for, like, like single issue of the comic. single issue of the year. Yeah. Hands down. Uh, absolutely. And, and that was, and, and Chad wrote in the, in the challenge section of the, for that battle, Chad actually wrote all of that out. Like, even just that, uh, uh, that comment of like, oh, you know, like that, the whole series is so good, but just that one issue three alone was fantastic. BJ said he did vote and it's not what you wanted. So sorry. Uh, BJ. (laughs) Our last pick of the week is called Number One, and it is a comic shop owner. It says comic shop owner isn't a job, it's a calling. And I'm going to let you hold this. And it's the book is called Number One. It's a Source Point Press book. And issue one of number one. Issue it's a one shot. Oh. Uh and that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. After reading it, that probably yeah. makes a ton that of sense. It makes more sense though. Uh this if I wasn't already a fan of Source Point, I would be a fan of Source Point Press just for making this book come out. Um and I so this book, I'm gonna Matt, did you get to read this before I ruin the whole thing? Okay. I don't wanna I don't wanna ruin all of it. Um but this this book is essentially the story of a guy who uh who got a who who grew up loving comics and it shows him talking to his friends about comics when they're kids and it shows them uh you know doing all of the different like things that kids do when they're like oh this is my character this is this one and uh, all the fun and just a little adult along the way who kind of showed him the path of loving comic books and then it shows him get like his first job in comics uh, as like a teenager and then it shows him uh, eventually getting his own comic book store and it talks about very realistically how hard running a comic book store is it talks about, you know, oh, like the struggles in his his 
marital relationship because of it and how he doesn't really keep in touch with any of his friends. Um, but every day he gets up and he goes to his comic book store and he gives free comics to the kids that come in there. And he remembers the important things like, hey, remember that one thing you told me you were interested in this? You know, they make a comic about it now. And I set it aside for you. And it shows all those those moments that mean something to him of helping his customers. But then it comes to the point where his comic book store is going to close. He cannot, like, he, it, it's, it's not a, if you didn't know, spoiler alert, there's actually not a lot of money in comic books. I know it's hard to believe when you see things like. On the retailer side. On the stuff, retailer yeah. side, on a day-to-day -day thing. And there's not, and, and there, and there's not, I mean, the idea that you're going to sell an Amazing Fantasy 15 even on a guy on an eBay page. Like, that's probably not something that you're really going to, you know, you're not going to probably come across that big of a key. Um, and, and that's the thing is, you know, it's, it's. It's not the margin of most comics on a retail everyday perspective is very, very small. Um, but those big keys are like, we're, you know, like we do have, there is some money in that obviously, but it is still rare to even find those in that. Um, but as a retailer, he starts to struggle and he's going to lose his store. And it's really the story of how the people come back to help him. Uh, and how each of those little things he did along the way while running his store really changed his life. And not just like as a store owner, like for the purpose of the store, but as a human, like in the store. And uh, I read it while I was running the counter the other day. And there, like I had been helping people. I had just given a kid a free comic because you know we have the free comic box that all kids get a free comic when they come in and I just helped a kid and then I was like all right well now that that was like the last person for a minute I'm gonna read this comic and I'm sitting in the store and it's completely quiet like it's the end of the night and I read this comic and I just started crying <laughs> like I was like oh okay now we're doing this like I was like I'm gonna cry over this freaking comic book right now um because it it's it was so it's so well done that everything in it like completely resonates like as a comic shop owner or probably as just a comic shop friend fan who's been around the industry for a while but for me you know there's so many times like you know Matt and I last Monday we got to go out to dinner and we got to do that because a customer gave us a gift card and uh that was the day two days after another customer had come in and brought in an entire tray like catering tray full of Franklin's I was like, I just got off work. I work at Franklin's. I just thought I'd bring you this whole tray of Franklin's and it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. And you know, um, there's so many things like that. Matt wanted a jacket that wasn't in stock anymore at the company. And like one of the customer, the customer who had one was like, I actually have another one and like brought it over. And there's so many times where, um, we are like, our lives are impacted by it. And it's like, there's so, there's so much work, you know, we work, we've worked every day this week until five in the morning and everybody's like, why do you do that? And then it's like, because you know, we got to get it done. We got to get it done. We want to make sure you're happy. Uh, I said something about how, uh, we need to get out at a certain time on this next Saturday, which we're going to talk about in comic book news. And, uh, Nigel was like, well, if y'all don't, it's only on y'all because you talk to everybody for at least 30 minutes that comes into the store. And I'm like, yeah, that's what you do. You talk, you make friends. Like, I'm making friends with all these people. Like, why wouldn't I? And he's like, no, that's a good thing. I'm just saying, like, if you need to hurry, like, y'all are the ones who don't hurry. And I was like, nope. And we never will. Like, if I'm late to something, I'm late to something. Because I want to make sure that, like, everybody has this incredible, amazing experience um, when they come here. Because they also give it all, we get all these crazy, like, they're incredibly amazing experiences to us. And I bring this up a lot, like, the people who shop here, present companies sitting next to me included, like, have become our family members and our best friends. And um, when Matt and I didn't get to have uh, the big wedding that we originally intended, we got married in the backyard, and we were like, we really want to do another one. It was people from, this, from Bat City that set it all up, that were actually officiating that coordinated the wedding the day of that watched like 
the store the day before so we could do a rehearsal after working 14 hours of free comic book day to make sure that everything after coming the day before to help us get all the stuff ready for free comic book day like there's so many and in, incredible things and and it was all bat city people who were in attendance for the most part it's the like our lives are and you know and people say this a lot like oh your lives are entirely the store and it's like yeah they are but that's never been a bad thing to us. Like, that's what we love about it, is that our friends and our family are, are the people who come in here. And this book really, really got that. And, you know, there is a little twist in there and stuff that I don't want to, like, give away as to why that's all necessary. But this book really got that feeling of, like, it, the whole point of a comic book store is to build community and you think it's the comic book store owner that you're putting everything into it and you're hoping that people get the community out of it and you don't necessarily always see it. But then sometimes you do. You know, yesterday you and, like you said, two other subscribers met here to go to another store to do a signing. Yeah. And then you came back here to talk about it with everybody here. And it was like, you guys all know each other, like, through comic books. Yeah. And it's, it's so cool to see, like, people just, like, building these friendships. And it's like, oh, you're not even necessarily doing anything with us, but you still included us by coming and telling us about it and, like, meeting here both before and after to, like, talk about it. And that's – it's super cool to get to be a part of everybody's lives and get to see how that plays out. And this book nailed that. And, and, and it nailed the hard parts of it, too. Right. Uh, but it was an absolutely incredible one – issue like experience of like oh somebody just wrote my entire life into a comic book <laughs> uh and that's fantastic so uh it was super cool to read it um they did a great job and the little twists and stuff in it make for just a really good story pick it up if you want to know what it's like to read to own a comic book store yeah it's great number one i thought it, i assumed it was going to be more i don't think so it could be it but i sense. think it's just a one shot um, I feel like it was just a one stop. Um, and yeah, so there it is. Uh, Chad said, I'm an introvert in the extreme. It's not family. If it's not family or friends of family, I usually don't have a social life, but Bat City alone has begun to change that. Thanks, Chad. Now y'all are going to make me cry again. <laughs> so, um, absolutely beautiful. I'm super happy to get to share this experience with y'all. Um, and, uh, you should read number one and uh, share that with us as well. Other than that, don't forget, if you haven't voted yet, uh, House of Slaughter versus Layla Star for uh, the pick of 2021. BJ said, Layla Star was great, but House of Slaughter has a local artist on it, and he'll reread it frequently, which he probably wouldn't necessarily reread Layla Star. So just to get, like, I thought I'd share somebody's review of, of the books. So... Um, yeah, and we do, it does have the great and wonderful Chris Sheehan on it, so you gotta give it extra points for that, because Chris is amazing. Uh, we've got some in-stocks. First up, it is the 25th anniversary of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and this is the 25th anniversary, um, uh, celebration, and it features that incredible Jenny Fritzen cover. Which is the only reason why I own that book now. <laughs> yes, uh, Radiant Black issue 13. As we go back into the Radiant Black world, and uh, I don't know if I have a copy of it. I might have to grab one out of the box. But Rogue Sun issue 2 also came out this week, I believe. Maybe not. Maybe I'm losing my mind. I thought it did, but here it is not. Um, Immortal X-Men issue 1 launched, and uh, this is one of the women his Women's History Month variants where we see Queen uh, Emma, St Emma, Emma Stone, no, Emma Frost as Queen Elizabeth. Whoa, got that all wrong. Um, the Excellent, issue two, this is the all red book on the ecstatics. Uh, Star Wars Bounty Hunters, issue 21 as a part of the Crimson Rain story. Miles Morales, issues 36. I know. Spawn issue 328 is out this week. Uh, Dark Ages issue 6. Tom Taylor's like dark deceased style story at Marvel. Uh, Captain Marvel issue 37. I love this. Thank you Marvel so much for putting on there. Jump in here for a new arc. I love when they do that. Um, uh, Shelter Division issue 3 from Source Point Press. This is one of those like great video game-esque style stories. 
Uh, the final issue of Spider Woman. This is issue Dang. 21, the end of it. Uh, you, if you come in and talk to Matt about it, he might cry because he's very sad. Um, Almost She'll American issue. Oh, absolutely. Issue 5 of Almost American. This is the end of Ron Mars' is series with Aftershock. Uh, issue 11 of Swamp Thing with this beautiful Francavilla cover. Unbelievable. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, God, it's so good. Uh, <laughs> issue 5 of New Burn from Chip Zdarsky and Jacob Phillips and Image Comics. This is a great detective story to talk about in noir book. Uh, Yusagi Ujimbo. This is issue 3 of The Goat and the Kid. Uh, the Magic Order. This is issue six from Mark Millar. Uh, Hellboy, The Silver Lantern Club, issue five. We've got issue six of Harbinger. Uh, is that Faith? Looks like Faith is in there. It is. Yeah. Um, Astro City returned this week. Hey. So that's exciting. I didn't know that. Uh, I totally missed that. It was in the box. I process way too many comics too fast uh iron fist issue two back this week um i couldn't see the eye at first and i thought it was a new book called ron, ron fist, fist. i was like why am i not reading this right that why sounds like a bill book box? uh issue three of silk is out this is the n- another new silk mini series not to be confused with the one that just ended which just ended why why do they keep only giving her miniseries? I think that they don't want to tie it into the mainstream continuity because the Spider People are Sony, so they're just making these miniseries so people can still get to know the characters, Spider but Woman? they're not. Uh, Spider, yeah, Spider Woman. I don't know how that falls into it. Uh, we'll see, but I think that they're trying to keep like Silk and Spider Gwen and all of those, I think they're trying to make miniseries so that, because so many people are learning about them right now, mm. so it's like, oh, if we give them a miniseries. They did that with Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi had miniseries, like a miniseries and then a miniseries, and then he finally got a full series. So I feel like maybe we're going to see that with some of these other characters that they're trying to build up a new following for. Um, which may also mean that Silk might be getting a movie that we don't know about because they're doing the same path that they did with Shang-Chi, so who knows? Mm. Um, X-Men, but it would be Sony, though, right? It would be Sony. Uh, X-Men Unlimited. This is uh, this was Latitude. It was a digital comic. This is that coming together. This is Jonathan Hickman and Declan Shadley, by the way. I know. I just noticed that. Uh, and it was done entirely digital so that... I'm going to have to hold my phone up for you to do this. But it was done so that it was made to go... Everything drops down. You mm-hmm. could almost actually open this up and show the art because it's super cool. Because it was meant to be yeah. just so you scrolled up. Um, so a lot of people come in and like, I actually just want to buy the issue because I want to see how it works in issue format because it was made to just be a scroll based comic. Um, so you can kind of see on some of the, like the pages, like, and there were no gutters. Mm-mm. I was told today. Mm-mm. It was no gutters. It was just completely Sorry, like, again. Cause you, that's one's just boxes. Yeah. Some there's one page that actually shows him falling. Yeah. Um, and that's a really cool one. Because it's it shows how that worked. And I don't know where it is. That might work. Um, yeah, see him just like falling down the thing. So the whole thing was just a scroll, like a scroll down comic. And now it's like side by side. So it's kind of cool to see how they went from that original concept of just being a scroller comic to mm. an actual comic. I mean, you're getting death with Shavi art. It's true. And you read it down and across. Yeah. So super cool, um, great team up right there, and uh, I'm I'm actually curious. I don't read a lot of Wolverine, but I was like, I'd actually want to read that a lot to see how it plays out in paper form. Yeah. Uh, War for Earth three issue two of two. Um, then we've got uh, Shadow War Alpha ish, so issue one of the Shadow War, which is going to be the next event for Joshua Williamson's Batman. It seems. I do actually have one copy of cover B of Batman Beyond the Black, uh, Batman Beyond the White Knight. So if you didn't get a copy, I have one copy of cover B, and I do actually have a couple more cover cover Bs allegedly coming in. Mm-hmm. And so if you just want to read it. There is a copy. And you want to read it. And you do want to read it. And then uh, Batman teamed up with FaZe Clan, the video gaming organization. And this is their little mini series that you can get if you missed it when it was digital only. And then lastly, Aquaman issue two. This is the combination of the two Aquaman stories coming together. 
um, and then trying to do some world saving. Quick question. Yes. Going back to the Batman phase kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Very much in the same vein as Batman Fortnite. Kind of, except... Batman, Fortnite is the game, and FaZe right. Clan are is people it, who it, play games. Right. Do you feel like there is enough draw to get video gamers, like, fan? Is this really going to be a good transition to get people who follow FaZe Clan to start reading comics? I feel like those two worlds are so different. Yes. Um, there, I don't think so. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of people like waiting for it. Like with Fortnite, it was they included the codes, the codes though. Yeah. But that, there were a lot of kids who, so when the Fortnite comic came out, I'm not going to lie. Like we put ours in the back and we saved them for the kids who had been calling for it for weeks. And uh -huh. so that people couldn't just come in to buy it for the code. Correct. And, uh, each week, each month when the next one came out, the kids would come in and our first question was, what did you like about the last one? We weren't stopping them from getting it either way, but we asked them, you know, because we wanted to see if the kids were interested. And all of the kids would tell you what their favorite part was. And I still see kids come in that only got, like, issue one and never got to get the other ones who are like, hey, do you have the rest of the Fortnite ones? Because I really liked it. And at this point, those codes are, you don't need them anymore. Right. And the kids are still coming in saying they want to get it. Like, oh, I want to read the rest of the series because I only got the first one for the code. I never got to read the rest of them. So we are seeing a lot of the kids who play Fortnite being interested. I'm well, not cool. seeing the adults yeah. that play Fortnite being interested in that comic mm. as much. So it is it is interesting. And there was far less intrigue for the second Fortnite book from Batman that didn't have a code. Mm -hmm. Um and so sense. it made and there the only ones I saw coming in for that were the kids who play Fortnite who were like, oh my God, it's Batman and it's Fortnite. Super cool. So. I just feel like this. I just I, I'm curious where Warner Brothers or AT and T if there's some contractual obligations or it's somehow they own both properties or I think it's the it goes because Marvel did a Thor ish uh, uh had Fortnite covers mm. when they had Thor in Fortnite <clears throat> they did Thor they did Fortnite covers across all of the issues. And so they didn't do a full on book, but they did do a new Thor story on Fortnite. Like there was a comic on Fortnite that you could read. Fortnite. It's just, Fortnite. It's just weird to me because <clears throat> like I, I'm not big into video games. I, I play them occasionally, but I don't know whose phase clan is. Yeah. So you're not appealing to me, mm -hmm. the comic book reader. And I think they printed that because that was made digitally and available oh, okay. only on the FaZe Clan website. So I think mm -hmm. their thought was, oh, people might want a physical copy. Or people who didn't know to go to FaZe Clan site might not have gotten it. Uh, I do know that most retailers were like, is this a thing? Like, I don't know who this is. There are a lot of comic book readers who do play video games. Um, it does cross over a lot, so there might be some that... It's kind of like, oh, we just want to see if anybody missed it kind of thing. Um, it's I, almost how it felt. Because they didn't even... They didn't do a big push like they did with Fortnite or anything like that. That wasn't a big push. The Fortnite one, it was an original mm. thing, so they pushed it. This was kind of like... In the same way that X-Men, uh, the Latitude issue, the Unlimited X-Men, like they didn't really push it because it had already been released digitally. This is another one of those, like, oh, it existed digitally in partnership with them. Mm. So we're making it in print in case somebody wants it, which I appreciate that DC doesn't just like does give the stores the option, uh, and 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 Marvel that the big two both gave the option on those books of like if somebody does want it, you can order it. You don't have to order it, but it is available if you do have people who are asking you for it, because that is a thing when it comes to digital comics that everybody's like, oh well, if everything just goes digitally, what's the point of comic book stores? Right. And there are people who do want that physical medium. So I, the big thing always, all the time is people getting mad at the big two for making digital comics. So I appreciate that the big two then turns around and says, hey, if you do want them, you can order it. Well, I mean, I, I, I like the combination of the two because like Marvel does the Infinity Comics on the Marvel Unlimited app. And that's where they do the Jeff the Land yeah. Shark one. And I, lo I love that stuff. It's really great. To me, I think the thing that is irritating me in this moment is the fact that we're going through a paper shortage. Yeah. And I would rather you put that towards more copies of White Knight Batman Beyond versus... And that comes down to the retailers. Clan. 
did the retailers order it? That comes down to that because they don't print them until we make an or- initial That's order. True. So if retailers didn't order it, it didn't go towards that. I, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, like you said, most retail, like how many retailers are going out there ordering more than a few copies of the Face Clan book? Most didn't. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and so it didn't go to that. But that's what I'm saying. The paper didn't go to that. Uh, yeah, that point I, I, because yeah, they I didn't guess that's print true. it because nobody, if it didn't get ordered, and Batman Beyond, the White Knight got did get ordered. Just and underordered. It's just I and not necessarily. I don't think necessarily that it got under ordered. I think that uh, it got ordered based off of what people were picking up for the previous series. And that's true. The and other two were not, they're not super popular. They, the, there was like that dip in like the middle of that yeah. series uh, with how many people were like, oh, I'll just trade weight it. Right. Um, and, and that's the thing that happens is then something like this comes in and it's like, oh, I want, and Batman Beyond for us wasn't a big series. The last Batman Beyond story was not pop, was not a big series. But, and it was only that. That first appearance that really drew mm-hmm. me is only that first appearance. First, and, that woman beyond, and a lot of people talked about that. So, there's if if Batman Beyond the White Knight was an underprinted in any capacity, it's probably because there was those lower numbers that made people go, "Well, I'm going to order it for like subs plus this many." Right. But I will say that it did sell out at Lunar, so whatever was printed did sell out. Yeah. Um. So there is whatever whether that's like more coming to stores or whatever but there i mean let's be honest there's going to be a second print there's multiple prints well, for course, all of the yeah. white knight um and so yeah it's that's where it's important to also talk to your retailer about what you want like whoever your lcs is like you need to tell them like hey i'm interested in this book because there's so many people that didn't text me until tuesday night to tell me oh i never mentioned it but i really would like batman <laughs> beyond the white knight and i'm like okay so by the time it happened i had that one copy of cover b to put on the floor by the time Wednesday at noon came around. Yeah. Because between Tuesday evening and, like, Wednesday morning, I had so many people messaging me, like, uh, to, and me personally and the Bat City page, like, hey, can I get this book? And there, I can only do so many because I only have so many. Right. So it's like you, you read your previous catalogs, uh, pay attention to the buzz, and then actually say, I want to add this to my pull list. Right. I want to subscribe to this. I want to order this. Because if you just say, oh, man, that sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Your retailer did not order you that book. Right. You have to (laughs) physically say, hey, order me this book. Because otherwise, there's a lot of things that sound really cool. And there are so many times where everybody's talking about something. So I'm like, oh, we've got to order like 30 copies because everybody's talking. And then nobody's like, oh, everybody's like, oh, I didn't want that. Why'd you yeah. give me this? I didn't want it. I'm like, because you spent the last two months talking about it. And they're like, because I thought it was interesting, but I don't want to read it. And yeah. I'm like. Yeah. And from a retailer, you don't want to sit there and assume that just because someone's talking about right. it, means you need to order a bunch of them. Because then if it doesn't sell, then you're sitting around with all these extra copies. It's like, okay, well. What do I do with them? Yeah. I can't send them back. I can't do anything. I now have all this. I have all this product right. that I can't do anything with. And I'm losing money on it. Yeah. So yeah, you have to tell people. You have to tell whoever your LCS is, however they do their system, add this to me, yes. order this for me, read your previews catalog, order things from your previews catalog. If you missed it at previews, you still can do it again three weeks out. So, the other great thing is here at Bat City is you can also just tell Shannon an artist or a writer, and just be like anything with that person's name on it. I remember Chad was in here after the signing. He was like, yeah, I think I just told you to put everything Sean Murphy on my, like anything that he does, put it in my box. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a Marvel or DC. And I'm the same way. I mean, I told you anything that's a Jenny Frozen book. Mm -hmm. If it's her, I don't care who the publisher is. She could do a Vampirella cover and I'm going to own a Vampirella book for that. I mean, I I bought, I, I I bought the Buffy the Vampire Slayer cover. Yeah. Like it was in my box. I was like, I don't even like Buffy. And then I see that cover, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm not even gonna question it. Right. Um. So it, here at Bass City, that works. Every comic book shop's not gonna be like that. Most people are like, I need the the title. Um. Especially too, like some shops are adapting the uh, Comics Hub. Mm-hmm. You or know. Cool list. And and that one, you have to go in and actually type it in. You know, it's it's. It's a, a bit more intricate and, and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, that's why I shop here. It's just, <laughs> I can message you and be like, hey, anything by this person, I, I want it automatically. Yeah. 
Um, that said, we've got some trades in stock and I am going to um, hand you this one. Well, I checked something really fast. Okay. Hellcop Volume 1. I was very shocked by this book entirely. Uh, it says here that it's a cyberpunk adventure, but this is basically if there is um, multiple dimensions that we can travel to. One of them is hell. And uh, of course, the way we're going to do it is we're going to police it and govern it. Um, so this follows a hell cop on his uh, journey uh, into the hell dimension, but um, it's also a murder mystery. Um, I, I think it's great. The art in this book kind of throws me off occasionally. I'm not really sure. Um, however, uh, I'm somehow I'm sucked into the world building of all of this. Um, so I, I definitely think you should check this out. It is $19.99 for an image title um, for volume one. And I believe it's six issues. Could be five, maybe six. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Oh, one through five. Yes. First five issues, Hell Cop. Check it out. I think it's a great book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you read some of Good Luck, I think. So you want to talk about Good Luck? Um, Good Luck is, uh, was this volume one? Oh, is this a complete the whole story? Thing. Boom yeah. Studios. Yeah, Boom Studios. This is uh the complete uh run of this. This is basically like in a world where uh uh oh, shoot. I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a book about a bunch a, t a group of teens who don't have luck, um who basically have to save the world that's been plunged into chaos because of these like luck monsters. There's like a good luck monster and a bad luck monster if I remember. Um, yes. Yes. It, all in all, the th main thing that you should take away from this book uh, is that the art is super fantastic. Yes. Um, it's very colorful, and it's enjoyable. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Matt, why don't you jump in on this right after, switch with me really fast, because I'm going to let Phil talk about this, and then I want you to talk about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is Curse of the White Knight. This is the second iteration uh, it was White Knight and then Curse of the White Knight, and now it's the Batman Beyond. Um, so this is the second uh, in the series. Uh, this is an amazing series. It's Sean, it's Sean Murphy doing both uh, writing and art uh, with Klaus Janssen, Matt Hollingsworth. Uh, it's a fun Batman story. Dude, it's awesome. Yeah. It's super great. If you aren't reading the White Knight series, guys, seriously jump onto it. It's an Elseworlds kind of a thing. Yeah. You can read it. Yeah. You know, you read Volume 1 of White Knight, you read this. Read the Harley Quinn if you want. You read this if you want. And the yeah. uh, the one you sent in. Uh, the Mr. Freeze one Oh, the one Mr. Shot. Freeze. Von Freeze so incredible. So good. It is so good. And it's not necessarily a backstory that we needed. I'm a huge, if you guys don't know, Mr. Freeze is my guy. Probably my favorite comic book character besides Spider-Woman at this point. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the two of them, that, that's that's my like dream crossover. Yeah. You know, JLA Avengers Spider Woman, Mr. Freeze, <laughs> obviously. That's such a weird combination. <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> She's like flying through the air. He's yeah, his freeze ray. I um, assume they would team up and fight together. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> he gets like a red and gold suit. She oh, gets a blue yes. and white suit. Oh. All right, all right. We've gone too far. You can read the Von Freeze one shot. I'm not sure if we have them. They kick around. I've seen them in yeah. two dollar bins at shops. But it's basically the story of his dad and how his dad was a Nazi in this White Knight universe, you mm -hmm. know, which is going to be a totally different thing. Shan wants me to talk about this. This is uh, Something's Killing the Children. Let me zoom in here. Um, this is Something's Killing the Children, volume one. We still have copies. If you guys haven't jumped into Something's Killing the Children, jump in here. You guys definitely can read House of Slaughter without reading this, but it's going to be confusing. And you can definitely read this and not read House of Slaughter, but then you're missing the whole big picture. So, why? Yeah. At that point, you know? I mean, it's one of the most talked about comics of the last couple of years. And with good reason. It's really weird, too. Um, the big thing that confuses a lot of people is that it reads side to side in a lot of the panels. Mm -hmm. Like, so on this kind of a thing, I'll zoom in here, you can see it's, you read across. And sometimes it's very confusing 
without really like you have to look at the middle of each one right. and kind of yeah. see if they connect and it becomes confusing but it's worth it yeah i mean it says it's an eisner nominee right there and, they, and they for good reason on the cover for good reason absolutely I did mean, you did you read killer queens I didn't finish it. I did. I'll jump in. Okay, Shannon. Let's Shannel, wait, that. Let's We're going to do some Shannon Jump to these, because I feel like these would be more... Oh, we can do that, too. Right? I can do this. Oh, yeah, do that one. Okay, all right. My favorite book right now, Bunny Mask, um, coming back. This is basically what would happen if you became best friends with the little girl from The Ring. <laughs> it, it is. It's this guy. He goes in, and he un- he's trapped by a serial killer. He... The serial killer makes him dig for his salvation. It's one of those like, okay, this guy's totally bonkers stories. Yes. And in digging for his salvation, releases the little girl from the ring and she comes out and kills the serial killer. And this is like the first four pages of the book. Yeah, it happened and, really quickly. Really fast. And he's in a coma and he wakes up and his world has changed. He keeps seeing this bunny demon around him and it's like his ptsd and you're like okay is this is he actually seeing it is this the ptsd the serial killer's daughter is still alive and he becomes friends with her and she's romantically interested and he can't be romantically interested in her because he is romantically interested in the demon (laughs) (laughs) okay so if the girl from the ring fast forward to the future and she grows up into a woman and you're like she's a hot demonic woman yes (laughs) Yes, because she's kind of a hot demon woman. It's not. It would be like if the, the girl from the ring was an older woman. Right. I guess it's not like a little yeah. girl character. It, no, yeah. If she grew up, if she grew up. Yeah. She was an aged up virgin, and, uh, and you're like, well, you're kind of you're evil, but you're kind of hot. Yeah, and you kind of are always trying to save me or save the world. In a <laughs> I'm the damsel in distress. Demon <laughs> way. Yeah. Absolutely. This PTSD. <laughs> It's a thing, and it's really, it's only four issues in here, but they're thick issues. It's Matt's favorite book. The thing that's fun about this is that it is that psychology. It is. I I literally just read that um, in our own image, and it's the same thing. It's these psychological, twisted kind of horror books that really make you reconsider perspectives on things. Because is it a PTSD? Is it not? You know, and you kind of don't know. The lines are blurred. Right, and it's and it's like, is this ghost a superhero? Superhero ghosts are cool. It's not really a thing that we. It's definitely that gray area. Yeah. Between, I don't know if you're good or bad. Yeah. But for sure. You're not hurting me, so. Yeah, exactly. But you yeah. can hurt other people for me. Yes. Yeah, which is it is kind of fun, and it always leaves you with more questions. Every issue will answer Every one issue. question. And then leave you with two or three more. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which I like to keep streaming. I'm like, dude, Paul Tobin, keep going. You know, a hundred issues, however long you Andrea want to do it. Art. Andrea Muti Art. Come on. Get out. Okay, it's there, yeah, for sure. Master Can I keep going? Are you coming back? I'm, I'm good. All right, whenever I can talk do about you, Epic Collections. I mean, yes. I was like, do you want to do the Epic <laughs> So, yeah, let me talk about that really quick. My favorite thing in this whole world that I still collect, people ask me all the time, hey, Matt, you own a comic book store. What do you collect? It's like blue chip keys at this point, big books. And Epic Collections. These things are awesome. And we got the Moon Knight ones out right now because Moon Knight dropped this week. I absolutely love Moon Knight because I know about the character. I know it was confusing for some people who don't know the character. Um, read it. Read it. Know what read it these. is. It's it's about dissociative identity disorder. And they put a little tag at the end of the show to kind of tell people that. I think they should have made a bigger thing about it because the show is about that. Mm-hmm. And they are trying to explain how that works through a film medium, which is a difficult thing to do. So there's like lapses in his memory and things like that. Well, the audience gets lapsed in memory and you don't know what's going on. Well, neither do people with dissociative identity disorder a lot of the time. And this is a, a, a sickness that, that happens and is a real thing in this world. And it's not an easy thing for us to discuss. And it's not a thing that we make a lot of media about. So I think it's a very important media um, that we have this Moon Knight coming down the pipeline. Please read these. These are super cool. Epic Collections will collect usually 20, 25 issues somewhere in there. They're big, thick collections. And they're all the pages redone in high gloss, high quality scans of the originals. Who was doing Moon Knight in the 80s? This is uh, volume three, so it's the uh, Doug Monick run 24 oh. through 38. And was he writing it? That Yeah, he was writing it. Zelens, Isabella, and Bill Sienkiewicz was originally yeah. doing the art. Okay, was, the yeah, I remember Sienkiewicz was doing it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yes. I have a lot of faith in Doug Monkey. Anything that that dude writes. Monik. Doug Monik. I think it's... I've heard Monkey. Monkey is the artist. 
Doug Monkey's, Doug Monkey's another artist, the guy who did the mask. Yeah. Oh, he's the M A. Oh, okay. K E. Yeah. How do you say this one? Monik. Monk. Monch. Munch. Doug Munch. Munch. If you guys know and you can <laughs> like phonetically put this Break in the it comments, down. Yeah, please do educate <laughs> yeah. us on how to do this. This is volume three. We also have volume two. And okay. I do have a volume one kicking around that I can dig up for you. Shoot me a message. Shoot the page a message. If you want all three. Um, Epic collections in general are super cool, and they all have these pretty little bindings on the sides. So they look great on your They're own. great for building out a bookshelf. Absolutely. And yeah. it's a great way to read the classics of books that are way too expensive at yes. this point <laughs> yes. that you can still read in really nice, high-def quality. We've got the first Hulk one, speaking of grand design. We've got the first Fantastic Four. We've got the first Daredevil. Yeah. You know, you can read these collections. Like tens of thousands of dollars worth of comics yes. that they put together for you right now. And here. 20 at a time. Yeah. That, yeah. And in a, in a paperback, because usually 20 issues is going to be a hardcover. I had a friend in high school who carried those around in his backpack. Really? Yeah, and he, just, they were beat up. He didn't care. He was like, "Who?" That's how like, mine are too. He's like, "I just want to read them." <laughs> My Daredevil like, ones all yeah. Best. He's like, "I'm yeah. gonna yeah, I get to read all this stuff from back in the day." Absolutely, like, trades are meant to be used. Yes, you know, unless it's like some first print trade of something that's gonna be. Dude, I have a you know first print Dark Knight Returns. Super cool. Destroyed. Yeah, destroyed. I've got a first Sin City. Ooh, yeah, right, it's cool. Yeah, this thing. You know, but uh, did they grade those? No. CGC doesn't grade trade yeah. paperbacks. You know, it's read your trade paperbacks. Yeah. Save your issues, read your trades. I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon. Thanks. Uh, and Chad said it's pronounced Minch. Minch. Like Min, M E N. Mm. Like Minch on the bench. Yeah, like Minch on the bench. Doug Minch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Chad. Uh, Chad yes. said, uh, I pulled up a podcast interview where he introduced himself, and it's Minch. Beautiful. Thanks, Thank you. Chad. Uh, and thanks, Matt, for jumping in. Uh, we mentioned ordering comics, and I realized that I was doing a workshop until comic we, until we started the live stream, and I did not do our order today. So ah. I had to run and do that really fast to make sure we got all of our DC comics. So thanks, Matt. Oh. Um. Other than that, since we're talking about Moon Knight, we'll just stick with that. There is also, finally, a reprint of the uh, Jeff Lemire, Greg Smallwood, uh, Jordi Belair, Moon Knight, which is such a good series. If you haven't read it before... Uh, this is the only one I've read. It's so good. And it is amazing. Of course, it's the only one you read. Oh, you read the Greg Smallwood, Jeff Lemire. Everybody's <laughs> surprised by that. But if you've ever seen this show, you already know that Phil has read of the, he has. the Jeff Lemire. Uh and then uh, we also have the uh, Marvel verse. So I love these. They make these ten dollar reprint books that just kind of pick random moments from the character's history that may or may not impact the show in some way. Um, which is funny because when I when the Wandavision one came out, I was like, "What does any of this have to do with it?" Because the two issues that they chose were. Uh, sp like two of the issues at the end were like Spider-Man issues mm -hmm. and I was like what does this have to do with WandaVision and now I feel like that's really coming into play way more but uh, this says Werewolf by Night 32 this, in it this does have Werewolf by Night 32 in it so if you want to read that first appearance of Moon Knight and you don't have uh, thousands of dollars lying around to just read a comic book here you go also I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there because yes read Moon Knight it's a great character but also read that Werewolf by Night run yeah like, start at issue one and work your way to the introduction of Moon Knight, because that is also an amazing series. So well. cool. Yeah. And I think it gets slept on way too much, because the only thing people ever talk about was Werewolf by Night. But Moon not Knight. for long, because Werewolf by Night is getting an, a Disney Plus show. No. And it's, it's allegedly, uh, possibly, based off of just the new Werewolf by Night, but there is going to be a Werewolf by Night Disney Plus. I didn't read the new stuff. And the other thing right now is you can't read Werewolf by Night in trade because there isn't one. Yes. And but you can't get all those issues because they're expensive. The Austin Public Library. There you go. They do have a copy. They have it? I believe Please so. Please check it out and bring it to us. Because yes. I'm pretty sure that's where I read it. Well, we'll find out when Phil does the research <laughs> for us. Uh, other than that, so books we still have in stock, uh, stray, or traits, sorry, that we have in stock. Stray Dogs, issues one through five. This is essentially, uh, what if, uh, there was a Disney movie about a bunch of dogs who were the 
well, owned by a serial killer. <laughs> I was like, how do I say that? I love that the the Silence of the Lamb meets Secret Life of Pets saying that Brian Michael Bendis mm-hmm. called it. it was really the best. Uh, this issue, like this book, really got a couple issues in before everybody started noticing it because it had those uh, horror movie homage covers that suddenly everybody like realized, oh my God, I should be buying this. And my thing, every time somebody would come for a horror movie homage cover, I'm like, just get a cover A and read it, please. That's all I ask. Buy your horror movie homage, but just, like, read this book because it's hilariously awesome. It's amazing that this is the concept that somebody came up with, and yet it works so well. Uh, Dogs have short-term memories. We all know that, and uh, these dogs can't seem to remember why they all have a past life that they suddenly uh, are finding might have to do with serial killers. And it's all done in Disney art, so it's great. Dude, they have the omnibus. Oh, there you go. The and awesome. they have all of the collections okay. as well. All right. Okay. Awesome Public Library. What's up? And I assume if they're making a show, those will be reissued. Yes. yes. Right. Phil has to show off his hat. Yes, my Awesome Public Library hat. Are you in their <laughs> ambassador program? I signed up, but I don't think I ever heard anything. Oh, yeah. I am. Awesome. Because I get too. the emails. Yeah. I get the emails. Um, The Me You Love in the Dark from Scotty Young and Jorge Corona, the book that I'm surprised made it as far that like that you all loved it as much as we did. I'm so happy to hear that this was a great book of uh, dealing with trauma, uh, dealing with, dealing with uh, toxic relationships and how that works. And it is done through a woman buying a haunted house to go live in so she can complete her art and falling in love with a ghost. So you know what? Matt got to fall in love with a ghost earlier. So now this girl gets to fall in love with a ghosty demon character, too. <laughs> Uh, does not work out well. So if you're thinking about falling in love with bunny mask, apparently falling in love with the ghost demon thing doesn't work. Um, can you show them the art? Yeah, uh, cause just Jorge Corona is just yeah, so good. Yes, mask page. Yeah, something, something good. Yeah, <gasps> yeah that's go. good. Let's get a nice two page spread in there. The like Jorge Corona, very talented artist. Read this, then read Middle West. Oh my god, read Middle West. Read it all the time. Read it every day. It's so good. Uh, also a convers- done by the same creative team and a conversation about the generational curse of anger and abuse. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis has moved to Dark Horse. He's making his way through the different publishing houses, but he has <laughs> taken uh, his old um, Jinx universe and all that went with that with him to Dark Horse now, and so Pearl is out at- I'm so- why is the DC let him do that? that? There it is. It's there. Tells you how much weight that guy carries. Yeah, so uh, Pearl is out volume one if you never got to see uh, Brian Michael Bendis. is kind of like his big indie type books that really put him on the map. This is your chance. They're all going to be coming out through Dark Horse. Um, and this is the first of the, the set with Pearl. I never yeah. read this one, but I need to because of the artwork. Right, that's a, that's a Phil artwork yeah. book for sure. Oh, my God, it was um, we're going to do Killer Queens came out this week. This is uh, the writer of Canto writing, uh, which oh, such weird, like going completely from different, like, yeah, completely different books. Uh, whereas Canto is, Canto is your classic fairy tale. This is, um, pulpy in space, like it's a space opera, like, kind of story in space but i love the tagline of these people put the sass in assassin this is a uh, all all queer team up in in space and it is fantastic and the entire team working on it i believe was all an all queer creative team um and yes. it's it's so good i love this book it was so much fun the two main characters are are both Hilarious. ridiculous so uh, funny issue one starts with them fighting a a, a space chimpanzee who has hench otters yeah. instead of like people as their their people their bad guys or henchmen uh, and their their otters and you had me at hench otters honestly I didn't you could have the book could have gone completely downhill after that and I would never remember uh, it's just it's so great and I'm so happy that it's out uh, it's fantastic pick it up yes it is a ton of fun. And it's well written. I love the characters. Definitely yeah. check it out. Uh, and then lastly from Black Bass, we have Alice in Leatherland in trade form. Yay! Uh, this book, I absolutely, absolutely love this book. This is the story of a of a, a girl who is a, uh, com- a 
picture book creator. She writes picture books for a living. And after the breakup between her and her partner, she realizes that she can't actually write any beautiful love stories in picture book form. She has no imagination and no happiness anymore. So she moves across the country to San Francisco, where she ends up finding a home to live in with a bunch of people who work as dominatrixes uh, and other like and in sex shops and things like that. And she's completely naive and completely nervous about being around everything. And then as She's rediscovering herself and learning to work in 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 the world. Uh, she builds out the greatest children's book ever, all about like her dating life and meeting all the different people. And it is such a good book, um, beautiful like slice of life rom com kind of story uh, that you would expect from Yolanda Zandafino. Uh, it's so good. Everybody should read it. Yeah, I I, I love the art in this book in particular, but. You, you've praised this book since it was coming out. Yes, and I will never stop. I did not expect to love that book as much as I did when I first started it because I was like, oh, you know, we don't... There's not, like, a lot of Black Mass books that we see coming out. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know if this is, like, one of those publishers, like, I gotta trust everything or if I need to read it. And I, I didn't really know Yolanda at that time, so I was like, oh, I don't know. Now, anything Yolanda does, I'm buying. Like, it's gonna be a book that I have <laughs> to get. Fair. Yeah, and if you didn't uh, read A Thing Called Truth, that's from Image Comics that was just yeah, recently that done. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, and I know uh, Hakate's Will is the other one they're doing right now that's really good. So um, those are the trades that we have in stock. Um, a reminder that if you haven't voted, uh, we're tallying up the votes tonight for uh the best of 2021 and it's down to uh house of slaughter versus uh um mini death of Layla star so make your make your choices uh you can vote here in the comments or you can go and vote on the post it's showing up either way for me whichever one you choose phil's voting right now <laughs> i wish i i wish i was i already voted speaking of voting Your comic industry news is, I brought the sign, um, because it's the easiest way to actually show you something, but we were nominated for the Best of Austin and the Austin Chronicles Best of 2022 poll, I guess is what it is. Um, So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for nominating us for your favorite comic shop in, in Austin. We have, you know, there's so many great comic book stores in Austin. It's so awesome to be included amongst them. Uh, and we're super, super excited about it. I know that sounds like one of those, like, Oscar speeches that everybody says. But I'm actually <laughs> really excited to be considered one of the comic book stores. Because all of the, you know, comic book stores in Austin have been around, like, 15 to 50 years. And then there's us. And people are like, how long have you been here? And I'm like, oh, my God, since 2019. And they're like, so, like, you just opened. And I'm like, Yeah. Isn't that cool? Like, we're here. We've been here. Like, so we are, um, we're the new kid on the block, and it's exciting to be nominated, like, with all of these other people. Um, and you can, if you nominated us, just so you know, you still have to actually go vote. Nomination is just to get us on the ballot. It's like the nominations were like the primaries. Like, who do you want to see running on the ballot? And now your ballot is made, and you have to actually go vote. Um, so go vote for us. The honestly to me, the hardest category is voting for favorite comic creator in the city of Austin because it does include um, John Goulson, it includes uh, Drew Edwards, it includes Donny Cates, and it includes Becky Clunan, which I'm excited that Becky got included this time, as she should be every time because she's the first female to ever draw Batman in an ongoing series. So the fact that she uh, t- takes this long to get listed on there is a shame, but Becky Cleanan is on there, and that's a a hard category. There's a lot of talent in there. And that would be where my vote would go. I love all of them, but that would be where my vote would go. Oh, I I know your vote's going to Becky. Always. (laughs) Always going to Becky, but um, we we love so many of them. Drew is a huge uh, friend of the store. He's been a a part of a a lot of our things. Uh, He is the creative Halloween man. We love uh, supporting Drew. We love seeing Drew come out and support us for things. Uh, I believe John shops at the store a lot. Um, we've got, uh, you know, obviously Donny Cates. We love him. We love him a ton. I'm actually really disappointed that uh, Megan is not the fifth person mm. on that list. 
Um, we need to work next year, Batfam, to get Megan Hutchison Cates on that list of uh, best comic creators in Austin. Well, doesn't she probably needs to live here long enough? Because she's only been here for like two years. Through since twenty seventeen, I think. Okay. So okay. yeah, you know, get it together. Let's get her on the list next time. Let's make the list all the female creators. She's paid her Austin dues. Yeah, she has. So let's get let's get her on that list next year. But uh, if you haven't um, if you haven't voted for us, you have until April eighteenth to do so. Um, please make sure you do. We would love to have your vote and then vote for everything else in Austin because there's a lot of small businesses on there. And remember that that's hugely important. And um, just like my small segue is that there are, like, and thankfully, like, oh, the comic book stores for the most part are small businesses, but um, a lot of times, like, the major corporations that are, they have chains in Austin get nominated against, like, the small businesses, and if you didn't know, just getting nominated for Best of Austin will exponentially, like, Mm -hmm. grow the business of that small business. Like, putting them on that ballot, and then all the people who have never heard of that company are going to see it. And so they're going to start going to it and getting those nominations is really, really huge. Winning is really, really great. Uh, our, our buddies over at Giants Layers won last year and I was so excited that they did because they had just lost May Days, uh, their cat. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had just had the store flooding and it was just such a great moment for them to have like that, that moment of victory. Like after having so many things go like their store flooded during the ice storm and then their, their cat, their shop cat died and uh, so it was, it was so great to have Dragon Slayer have, like, this really great moment last year. Um, so it means so much to, like, the people in the shops, but it also means so much to the businesses. So if you have the chance, I know there's a ton of, like I said, big businesses nominated, but just remember that the small businesses are really very much impacted by your vote um, and the recognition that they get out of that. So, so local, vote small. There you go. And uh, vote for Best of Austin. And thank you to everybody who said they just did that. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing that I want to bring up is everybody has been asking me all week long, Shannon, did you get JLA versus Avengers last week? I am going to tell you that yes, I did. And then I'm going to break your heart and tell you that no, I did not get 45 of them, like the 45 of you who asked me before they ever came out, and the 45 of you who have asked me since it's come out. Uh, I did not. I got a couple of JLA versus Avengers new prints from the Hero Initiative, um, And all of the retailers have kind of been talking about this in their retailer groups and things like that. And most of them have reached out to George Perez and said, what would you like us to do? And George said, I mean, give the money back to Heroes Initiative. Do a raffle. Do an auction. Raise money for Heroes Initiative. Put raise money to put books in classrooms, raise money for the Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, do something good with it. Mm-hmm. You can, you know, do an auction, do a raffle, whatever you need to do, but just use it as a way to raise money for those things. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. So we do have a copy of um, JLA versus Avengers. Uh, we actually have more than one, but not that that's that's it. We have more than one <laughs> as in not more than that. Uh, so we are actually going to do an in-store raffle, which we've done um, in the past, or a random chance drawing, whatever you want to call it in the state of Texas. Um, but we are going to do, uh, much like you've seen before, where we have it on display in the store and we kind of have raffled off um, slabs and things like that. We're going to do that again, and this is going to run until free comic book day which is May 7th, which is your other piece of comic book news. The first Saturday of May is Free Comic Book Day. Uh, We are going to announce the winner on Free Comic Book Day. And you can purchase your tickets to win in the store. The money is going to go to George Perez's idea of Heroes Initiative, which helps comic creators who are in need. Uh, There is no union for comics creators. There is no health insurance. There is no... There is actually... You know, the Screen Actors has a Screen Actors Guild, so if you're a Screen Act, like, or Screenwriters have the Screenwriters Guild, so if you are a screenwriter for movies, you can get insurance right, for, through, through your union. Yeah. There isn't one for comic creators still, because nobody takes comic creation as a serious thing yet, and so they can't get health insurance through that, uh, and their publishers don't have the ability to give them that, because they are considered contract employees, so... Many, many, many comic creators don't actually have um, health insurance and ways to support themselves, and they don't own those royalties, and they don't get paid out. Uh, so Heroes Initiative does the great thing of helping them 
um, and we want to help give money back to Heroes Initiative for continuing to help people um, who make our comics get the help and that they need when that time comes. So if you would like to buy tickets for this, uh, we're going to, of course, we'll make an Instagram and a Facebook post that shows you all the ticket pricing and how you can order them um, through that. But you can also do it in store from now until Free Comic Book Day. We'll have it up on, uh, uh, we'll have it up. And in the store, and uh, you can you can buy those tickets through Free Comic Book Day. So uh, if you're wanting one of these, that's how you're gonna get it. You could end up getting it for as little as the price of one ticket, or you could buy a bunch of tickets. So instead yeah. of buying it for six hundred dollars on eBay, you might be able to get it for. You but know. also remember too that every ticket that you're buying is going to help creators. So you're you're doing something really good, and yeah, you may win a book, but if not, also remember, like, because I know I'm I'm gonna buy tickets, like, yeah, I uh, partially because you know I, I do want the book, but also because I think Heroes Initiative is movie. is a really great cause, mm -hmm. um, and if I made more money, I would give comic creators all of my money like i would just send them paychecks you know and be like hey if you need to go see a doctor let me pay for you to go see a doctor so this is that outlet where they can do that so you definitely come in and buy tickets because you know and, and it's a good way to honor george perez it is it is absolutely a great way to honor george perez it's what he asked for the books to go to yeah and a lot of people have been really mad they're like well why was there only seven thousand well because we're in paper shortage and it's a trade Correct. paperback Correct. and heroes initiative went to the printer and said how many can we have this quickly yeah. because we want it to be out so that while george is you know still alive so he can get one and that it can be and that he can be a part of the experience and uh, they said the most we can give you is 7000 And so that's what exists. And yeah. that's what we're doing. We're going to do that. Um, if you want to if you want to be a part of it, you can you can get into that raffle uh, by coming into the store or looking for those posts in the future. Um, before I go to the next thing that I was going to say, Chad has comics coming out this week. Uh, Spider-Punk number one is launching this week. Very excited. <laughs> Uh, Earth Sweet. Prime, number one, Batwoman, Heavy Metal Drummer, three, Hakate's Will. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Cold of Icarus, issue two. I've had a lot of people coming in this week asking. Uh, Wonder Woman Historia, issue two. Wow. So, very excited. Nice. Speaking of Becky Cloonan, that cover B, Becky Cloonan cover, is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Just know that right now. Go look it up. Uh, it's crazy awesome. Uh, the Joneses issue one from AWA. The Ocean Will Take Us number one from Aftershock. They have already been pumping up that book a lot. What's it called? Uh, the Ocean Will Take Us. Uh, Star Girl from Behemoth. I'm very excited. Very excited about that. That's going to be all in your pinks and purples. You're going to love it. Um, West of Sundown issue one from Vault. Finally. Uh, I've already read it. It's fantastic. Um, Alice Ever After, number one from Boom. Radiant Red, number two. X-Men Red, number one. Devil's Reign, number six. And Moon Knight, number ten. It's going to be a busy, busy week. There are so many more comics, um, but I, I closed mine. So uh, good job, Chad, for getting Oh, Lego Ninjago's out this week. I have so many kids who are excited about that. Um, Little Monsters, number two, is out this week. Monkey Meek, number four. I'm just throwing some more out there that you might care uh, to hear are coming because it's going to be a really good week. Uh, the Rocketeer book is out this week. Really excited about that. The, there's is a new Rocketeer IDW? book from IDW. I'm oh, very nice. excited about. Um, cool. Yeah. I'll check that out. Um, the other thing is I just wanted to talk about the fact that we had a cool workshop today and I wanted to throw a shout out to the Longhorn Comic Club. Uh, the University of Texas Longhorns have a comic book club and oh. they came out today. We had 24 Almost, I think it might have ended up being only 22 in the end, but we had uh, tw about 22, 24 students today from the University of Texas come out to learn how to make comics. We went through uh, like a brief history of the comic book industry, uh, talked about like the Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, all of that. Um, it was really funny to tell them that the modern age began in 1986 when none of them were alive at that time. <laughs> so I was like, I wasn't either, you so. can't really call it the modern age when nobody out here has was alive for another like well i mean at some point uh, you know there will there will eventually be there's already talks about it a lot of comic historians have already started to break down whether or not we should have a, a platinum age the dark age uh 
There, there are a lot the of them are calling age. the Dark Age uh, the the time of the Frank Miller and Watchmen. They've now started to refer to that as possibly the Dark I'm Age of so comics old. because it is actually like when comics went from like moved to like, hey, how dark can we make it? Because isn't that also like where the beginning of Vertigo started? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. there is there is some historians that are referring to it as that. There's a lot of really cool names that they're giving to it to give, make that split. A lot of really cool splits. I have it all documented. If you yeah, want to let's talk move about away this. from the bronze and silver. They're gonna keep that, but then they're no. gonna split up the modern age because we're at the it. point where we need to split. We need to split the modern age. Um, and then we worked on some really cool workshop, uh, or we worked on some really cool comic making. Uh, they made some incredibly awesome designs today. Uh, we had his comics about Squidward from SpongeBob, uh, Garfield being roommates with Peter from Family Guy, um, Lego Joker being in charge of the IRS uh, was a good one. We saw uh, my favorite possibly of the day was one of the girls created a story about a horse that was fighting Batman. And Batman came to the horse and said, your dark reign is over. And the horse said, nay. <laughs> and I was like, well, you win. <laughs> it's not a competition, but you might have won. Uh, that was beautifully done. I'm so proud. And the artwork that these students did was incredible. So Longhorn Comic Club, you guys rocked. So it's it's a, it's a club that creates comics, no, not reads them? they're a club that reads comics. Oh, okay. And we taught them how to make comics. Today. Oh, okay. Um, so we had, um, I was out there when we do our writing workshop or our comic creation workshops, I'm out there to teach, I'm there to teach writing. Um, and we have two incredible artists and in residents, uh, that help with it, which is of course, uh, our, our amazing, wonderful Chongo ATX, uh, Juan, uh, who is out there to, who just shows so many incredible things. And then of course, uh, Josh from Geek Suites who comes out there and works with that too. So either one or both of them are always there. And thankfully they were both there today to talk about some really cool art. So um, it was a lot of fun. So excited. Thank you to Longhorn uh, Comic Club for coming out. And we hope we get to work with y'all some more in the future. Um, and other than that, I thought there was one more thing, but I already forgot what it was. Oh, yes. Very important. Uh, this Saturday coming up, April 9th, the uh, Batsy will be closing early. So uh, keep an eye on our social media and our Google for an update to those hours. Uh, we will be closed early, April 9th, that is Saturday. It'll probably be closer, like around 5 that we'll close. So if you need to come next Saturday, make sure you come early um, because we will be, be closed at night. So thank you so much. Um, that said, lots of great comics. We got to announce that winner really fast. So uh, according to Chad, who just did a tally for us, House of Slaughter was your favorite book of 2021. Um, and I would like to give a major shout out to the incredible Chris Sheehan uh, for being a part of the Bat City family, for drawing an incredible book. I wish that Autumnal would have come out in 2021 so it could be like included too. I know we included it in 2020, but most of our subscribers didn't read it until like 2021. Uh, they jumped on it. So I feel like Autumnal is also winning in this moment. But uh, congratulations, Chris Sheehan and, and team on House of Slaughter. That was a fantastic book. Thank you for giving us more of Aaron and his story. And I'm still going to hold on to the fact that Aaron is probably secretly um, a dragon, an actual dragon. I want to believe that there's things there. The folklore is going to get bigger. I can't wait. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and look for more House of Slaughter to come as that art, that story continues. And that, we will see you here in the shop on Wednesday. Thanks for an incredible week. Uh, we love you all. Y'all are amazing. Keep reading. We'll see you then.